This is Heartland Mistletoe, a Heartland Cowboy Christmas Sweet Romance, Book 8. Written by Jesse Gussman. Performed by J. Dice. Chapter 1 Annie Wilson walked down the Prairie Rose sidewalk, carrying six grocery bags. Since she'd bought Catherine Conley's house, right on the main street off Prairie Rose, and moved in with Graham and Pap, she'd been within walking distance of a grocery store for the first time in her life. Turning right and crossing the street, she walked up the path to Miss Matilda's house. That was another advantage of being able to walk to the store. She could grab groceries for several older people in town. Only two of the bags she carried were hers. She hadn't really needed to go shopping, but Matilda and her neighbor Joe had both needed things today, so she'd made a run. One thing she learned, the hard way, was that it was much easier to make several smaller trips than one big grocery run. She could carry ten bags, but the bags didn't always survive the trip. Going around to the side door and knocking on it, she opened it carefully and stepped into Miss Matilda's kitchen. I'm coming, Annie. I saw you on the sidewalk, Miss Matilda called from the living room. You always do, and I wasn't worried about it. I know where these things go, Annie said, setting the bags down on a chair and rooting through until she found the one bag that was Miss Matilda's. She had the sugar put away, the milk in the refrigerator, and the bananas sitting on the counter before Miss Matilda shuffled out. Goodness, girl, you move fast, Miss Matilda said, not going to the table but going straight for Annie, where she wrapped her arms around her and gave her a big, warm maternal hug. Annie returned it. She'd lost her parents suddenly in a traffic accident, and Miss Matilda's hugs reminded her of those her mom used to give even if Miss Matilda was closer to her grandparents' age. She supposed the longing to have her mother back would never ease. Not that she was grieving still. She wasn't. She had a peace in her soul, knowing where her mom was, knowing that her mother was waiting on her. She didn't worry about that. But those assurances didn't make her miss her mother any less. That's where she had trouble being sad. I hope you can sit down and chat for a while, Miss Matilda said, her hands on the table as she pulled out a chair to sit down herself. I'd love to, but I can't. I have ice cream in Sam's bag. I don't want it to melt. That man is always telling me I need to eat better. And now look at him, ice cream. Annie grinned but didn't say anything about Sam's dietary choices. She didn't get groceries for the older folks in town just so she could gossip about what they ate. She did say, I think, this is just my unprofessional opinion, but I think sometimes you have to balance what's healthy with what makes you happy. I mean, come on, what's the point in living to be 100 if you eat radishes three times a day? There's no fun in that. Would it be better to die at 50? Miss Matilda said, playing devil's advocate just because she knew this was one of the places where Annie could be passionate. Maybe, if you die happy, if you die doing what you want, isn't that a person's choice? God only gave you one body. If you're saved, the Holy Spirit resides in it. That makes your body the temple of the Holy Spirit. If you put holes or graffiti or junk food in it, it's really not taking good care of the body God gave you. Annie wasn't always sure she agreed completely with Miss Matilda, but she definitely wouldn't argue. There was no biblical basis for her stand, while Miss Matilda had all the Bible in the world behind her. The body was the Holy Spirit's temple. They were to take care of it and respect it as such. But whether that meant she wasn't supposed to eat potato chips or pierce her ears, she wasn't entirely sure. She always liked to err on the side of caution, though. And she enjoyed talking about and studying nutrition. She actually loved creating healthy meals and enjoyed cooking for her grandparents. 
She gathered up her bags, saying, The headline on the farmer's almanac in the checkout line said that this was going to be a really bad winter. Sometimes the almanac was correct, sometimes it wasn't, which was pretty much the way any weather report was. I agree with that. I can feel that in my bones this year. I think we're going to be getting a lot of snow, and it's going to be a lot colder than average. Miss Matilda spoke as Annie walked to the door. I trust your bones as much as I trust any weather report. Call me any time if you need something. I'm just a couple houses away, and I can be here in an instant. I know. Since you moved in, I've taken advantage of your kindness more than I should. But it is nice to have someone who responds so quickly. Thank you for taking care of this old lady. Not a problem. It's my pleasure. And my grandparents love it when you visit, so don't be a stranger. Miss Matilda nodded. The walk down the street does these old bones good. Although, I have to admit, sometimes it feels a lot longer than three houses. Annie laughed, knowing that someday that would be her. But right now, she could walk forever. She even ran sometimes, just for fun. She didn't have a problem with her leg strength and endurance. But because she was so small, her upper body strength was abysmal. She was terrible at baseball and had been a miserable failure the couple of times she tried tennis as well. Take care, she said, walking out the door, feeling happy and light. Doing kind things for others always made her feel good. And while she didn't look at herself like some kind of saint because she was delivering groceries, she did think she was doing something worthwhile and helpful, which made her even more happy. Crossing the street, which wasn't busy at all this time of day, she walked up the walk to Sam's house, not feeling quite so alone. Sometimes, especially this time of year, she wished she'd found that special someone to share her life with. Sam was a little more aloof than Miss Matilda and met her at the door, offering her money for bringing his groceries. Which she refused, of course, and had every time he'd done it. He still insisted on it. She supposed it was his pride. Regardless, he refused her offer of help to put the groceries away, thanked her again, and she was back on her way. She loved the little house that she'd bought from Catherine. It was perfect for her and her grandparents. Not too huge, but big enough for them to be able to live together and not feel like they were living on top of each other. There were two living rooms, which meant that her gram could watch TV in one and her pap in the other, and neither one of them had mentioned the word divorce for at least a week. It had taken a couple of months for them to settle in, since they had lived an hour to the west of Prairie Rose all their lives, spending most of that on their farm. But when Annie's brother, Ferris, had gotten married to Meg McCartney and settled down on her farm right outside of Prairie Rose, they had been persuaded to leave the town they were living in and move so they were just a few minutes from Ferris and his family. Walking up the three steps and opening the front door, which she had locked, Annie called out, I'm home, before she closed the door and walked down the hall to the kitchen. She couldn't hear the TV, and figured either one or both of her parents were watching it with the sound off and possibly sleeping in front of it. They often did that in the afternoons. It didn't surprise her when neither one of them came to the kitchen. Not that she needed help. She was quite capable of putting the groceries away by herself. It did surprise her, though, as she was putting the oatmeal in the cupboard, that she heard the front door open. Figuring it could be Miss Matilda, who probably would have knocked at least before she opened the door, she listened for whoever it was to let the house know they were there by calling out. No one did. Odd. Her eyes narrowed as her hand lingered on the oatmeal, wondering if the wind had blown the front door open. Had she not closed it tightly? There was always wind in Iowa, but it hadn't been bad this afternoon. Certainly not any worse than usual, and maybe slightly better. Footsteps, heavy ones, sounding like a man wearing boots, came down the hall. A sliver of fear cut through her, 
sharp pain cramping on her insides. At least they were coming to the kitchen and not stopping at the living rooms. She at least might have a chance to protect her grandparents. She hadn't mentioned this to Miss Matilda, but the other headline she'd seen in the grocery store had been, Couple Murdered in Beds by Unknown Assailants. There were always headlines like that, and she usually just skimmed over them and ignored them. But the heavy footsteps, the person who didn't call out, someone just walking in their house, made that headline flash like a billboard in her mind. In that split second, after she heard the footsteps, thought of the headline, and knew they were coming toward the kitchen, she tightened her grip back on the large brown container of oatmeal and pulled it back out of the cupboard while looking frantically around the kitchen for any other kind of weapon. Seeing none, she crept to the side of the kitchen doorway, careful to stay out of sight. It was her responsibility to take care of Graham and Pap. If that meant she had to attack an assailant to try to keep him from murdering her grandparents as they slept in their easy chairs, she would do it. She might be small, but she'd always made up for that in tenacity and bravery. There was a small stool right by the doorway, one she kept there out of the way but ready to use when she needed it to get up to reach the higher cupboard shelves. Being short had never been a blessing. Except now. Because she had the stool there, and assuming whoever it was would be taller than she was, she stepped up on it, holding the oatmeal above her head, ready to bring it down on top of the assailant, hopefully rendering him unconscious or at least befuddled, until she could think of something else to do. The assailant appeared in the kitchen, just as Annie realized she should have grabbed the stool and hit him with that. Too late. Maybe because she was kicking herself for not thinking and for having oatmeal as a weapon instead of the wooden stool, she swung with all her might, channeling all the adrenaline in her body into her upper torso to really make this blow count. The oatmeal came down on top of a full brown head of hair and immediately split apart, scattering oatmeal everywhere. She wasn't sure what she thought the oatmeal was going to do, but that hadn't been in her plan. Nevertheless, she was already rushing to do step two, which was jumping down from the stool, grabbing it, and smacking the man in the face with it, or wherever she could that might mortally wound him. What in the world? The man sputtered, brushing oatmeal off him and befuddled for sure, but definitely not hurt. If this ever happened to her again, she needed to shove the oatmeal aside and grab a jar of honey or something. Mental note for next time. With the stool in her hand, she held it over her shoulder, focusing on putting all her strength into hitting him as hard as she could. He wasn't excessively tall, although taller than average, but he was also large, substantial. Not a slender teenager, but a man with broad shoulders, and while she wouldn't call him fat, he wasn't skinny. Still, something about him looked familiar. An instinct made her pause just a second while his head came up, and his eyes, blue as the sky in summer, looked straight at her. She stared at him, her mouth open, the stool raised above her shoulder, as memories flooded back. She hadn't gotten a great look at him the first time she'd seen him, because it had been dark that night, but the moon had been full, and she'd been able to make out the features of his face. That was the night he'd tackled her in front of her brother's house, tossing her into the bushes, scratching her face, and treating her like a burglar. Kind of the way she'd just treated him. Although he had walked into her house without knocking, without calling out, and she'd broken oatmeal all over him. His eyes narrowed as he recognized her as well. I guess you owed me the oatmeal, but I'm pretty sure if you hit me with that thing, you're going to be one up. He held up the palm of his hand where two white scars were slightly raised on the pad of flesh at the base of his thumb. Teeth marks. From her. She twisted her lip, pulling it back, and slowly lowered the stool. 
I'm sorry, I... What was she doing? Why was she apologizing? This was her house. She straightened her back, shaking her head a little. What are you doing in here? Why didn't you knock? What are you doing squatting in my sister's house? The man returned, just as forceful as she had sounded. Just because the house is unoccupied doesn't mean you can walk in and make yourself at home. He looked around the kitchen, likely realizing she had really made it her home. This is my house. I bought it. This is my sister's house. This is where I live when I'm home from the harvest crew, which is what I am now, and where I'm going to live, and you are in the wrong house. Then he looked around the kitchen again, maybe seeming to notice that the decor had changed slightly since the last time he'd seen it. Catherine, apparently this man's sister, had decorated the kitchen with lemons and geese. Annie had redone it in a more modern look, with green and gray highlighting natural wood. You changed her kitchen? The man, Lincoln. Lincoln was his name. He looked around, disbelief on his face. You have taken squatting to a new level. I bought this house from Catherine. I believe she is your sister, which is pretty much the only fact you have gotten right since you walked into this house uninvited. She emphasized the word, uninvited. You bought it from Catherine? I did. When? Sometime between the last time you attacked me and now, when you walked into my house like a burglar intent on killing my grandparents and me in our sleep. The man's face scrunched up. I walk in unannounced, thinking it's my right, and automatically you think I'm going to kill everyone on the property? You have way too active of an imagination. I'm small. I can't wait for people to announce their nefarious intentions before I act. I have to be proactive. Well, I hate to ruin our perfect record of disagreement, but I agree with you for the first time in our lives together. You are small. I think my size is a personal subject that we should not be discussing. You brought it up. She gritted her teeth, thankful she didn't have to deal with this man on a daily basis. Well, now that we have that straightened out, I wouldn't want to keep you from whatever it was that you were going to do, so feel free. The man shrugged and walked to the refrigerator, opening the door. Chapter 2 Excuse me, she said. She'd meant he could leave. Don't you have something to do? He closed the door and looked at her. I was going to come in, grab something to eat, and go to bed. I've been driving since three o'clock this morning, and I'm exhausted. Oh. They stared at each other. She knew what the polite thing to do would be. The house had five bedrooms. She had one, Graham and Pap had the other one, and there were three empty ones. All of them had spare beds in them. Some of them actually had two, since Catherine had indeed been allowing her brothers to stay in this house when they were not on the harvest crew. But that had been last year. It wasn't her fault that Catherine hadn't told this particular brother that she sold the house. The man stared at her, his face pinched, with dark circles under his eyes, and he had the weary carriage of a man who had worked long and hard and needed to rest. There weren't any hotels in Prairie Rose. He would have to drive twenty minutes to the next town in order to get a room, and it wouldn't be a great one just a motel beside the interstate, with a big parking lot that accommodated truckers. She figured he was probably used to sleeping in such conditions. Although she thought she remembered someone saying that their dad had built rooms above the garage that he owned outside of Prairie Rose. Why wouldn't he be sleeping in one of those? Her eyes dropped to his hand, hanging at his side. 
she'd given him scars in their last encounter. The little scratches she'd gotten on her face from falling into the bushes had healed up fine. She probably owed him a good night's rest. If you'd like to stay here for the night, you can, she finally said, not really wanting him to take her up on the offer, but knowing she should show politeness. While the situation maybe didn't demand it, it certainly requested it strongly. And she did owe him. He'd never be able to forget her with those scars on his hand. That might be an awkward conversation he would have to have with his future wife. The idea made her lips twitch. You think me needing a room is funny? He said, tilting his head. The dark circles under his eyes were even more emphasized, although his eyes were alert, and she didn't doubt that if he had to, he could keep going. Men like that always could. No. I was just thinking, because of the scars on your hand, I probably owe you a room. I'm not staying long. If you don't mind, maybe I will take you up on it. Just three days, and I'm traveling with my dad to Argentina and will be there over Thanksgiving. She had offered a night, not three nights, but then he'd be gone. She supposed three nights was worth a lifetime scar. Or maybe not, but it was a start. In the meantime, I'll check around and see if there's somewhere else I can stay. Dad has rooms above the garage, but my brothers all have those, and now I know why. No one bothered to tell me that Catherine had sold the house. I'm sorry. She didn't know what else to say. It wasn't exactly her fault but she felt bad for this man who had just been looking forward to some food and rest. I was getting ready to cook supper. If you want to take a shower and pick one of the three bedrooms that are unoccupied, you can. She wasn't afraid to invite this man into her house. She knew Catherine and knew the family. Everyone in Prairie Rose did, and they were good men. With her grandparents there, they had appropriate chaperones. Lincoln let out a breath, deep and long, like he didn't want to take her up on her offer, but he was tired and didn't want to have to try to figure out where else he could stay. I'm sorry to put you out. I probably shouldn't take you up on this, but it's been a long week. We've been pushing to finish up, and I've just about had enough. I'll stay here tonight and see what I can find tomorrow. That's fair enough. And really, staying for three days isn't a big deal. Maybe you can just plan on finding somewhere else for when you get back after Thanksgiving, she said, trying to be gracious. And now that the scare had worn off, and that she talked to him for a few minutes, she realized he wasn't the monster she remembered him to be. Actually, that wasn't true. She hadn't remembered him to be a monster at all. He made a logical assumption about her when he found her lurking around her brother's house throwing rocks at the windows. He'd been a lot larger than she was, and in her experience, people who were bigger sometimes threw their weight around. She dated a couple of men who were much larger than she was, and they always seemed to think they could take advantage of her because of her size. As she had looked back on that night, she realized that while Lincoln had manhandled her, he could have hurt her a lot worse than the few scratches on her face. She was the one who had bitten his hand and had given him a bloody nose. Oh, goodness. She'd forgotten about the nose. She probably owed him more than three nights. Was your nose crooked before, or was that because of me? She asked, noticing that his nose, which suited his face perfectly, twisted slightly to the left at the end. That was you, he said, but his eyes held humor, almost like he thought it was funny that someone of her size had broken his nose. Now that it wasn't hurting anymore. She tried not to let her own lips twitch. I'm sorry about that. I, I definitely owe you three nights, if not more. I'll take you up on the three nights he said immediately. But I'll try to find something for when I come back. I can only take this, he held up his hand, 
scars out. And this, he pointed to his nose, so far. Although, I think people would be wise not to underestimate you. He grinned. She returned it, to her surprise. She wanted to like Lincoln. She also wanted to have righteous anger, but her naturally fair personality had never been able to allow her to pretend that anything that happened that night had been all his fault. Even today, with the oatmeal and the stool and the breaking into her house, it had been an honest mistake on his part, and possibly a bit of an overreaction on hers. I'm sorry about that, she said sincerely to her surprise. She, she hadn't even been considering apologizing, but it seemed like the right thing to do. After all, he had two permanent reminders of that night, and she had none. It's okay. Honestly, I'd rather have the scars on me. Looks like your face healed up okay. It did. Once they wiped off the blood, there was barely a scratch on my cheek, and even the deeper spot by my ear healed up without a scar. Men carry scars better than women for some reason, he said, just acknowledging the inequality is a fact, which she appreciated. Men and women were different. They had different strengths, different abilities, different thoughts and feelings, and she hated it when people tried to lump them together and act like gender wasn't a thing. She was a woman and proud of it, and she didn't want scars. Well, thank you. Thank you for not being upset about that. I think if my nose were crooked because of that night, I might have a little bit harder time apologizing. I need to apologize, too. I'm sorry. I jumped to conclusions, kind of the way you did here, although I think we both had legitimate reasons, or at least felt like we did. I believe you're right, and all is forgiven, easily, and already, on my behalf. Mine too. That night, I left with no hard feelings, although I did leave with some pain, particularly on my nose. You realize my eye turned black after that, too? No. This time her lips really did turn up. <laughs> That's terrible. Maybe you could say that a little bit more sincerely? She tried to rein in her smile, but was unsuccessful. I took a lot of teasing over that. The black eye that I got because the little wisp of a lady sucker punched me right in the nose. While I stood there like a dumb ox allowing it. Tom Ox? He shrugged. Brothers, they come up with all kinds of things to make fun of a person. He grinned. Maybe I've done it a time or two, and so I probably deserved it. I see, she said, although she really didn't. She did have a brother, but maybe because of the things they'd been through, he didn't tease her or pick on her. In fact, he treated her like one of the most important people in his life, giving her deference and honor, and she never doubted that he loved her. The whole idea that he would call her a dumb ox was preposterous. Didn't seem very brotherly. Not to her. All right, if you're sure you don't mind if I stay here, I'm going to go take a shower. Go do that. My grandparents are here, Philip and Nancy. They're probably sleeping in the living rooms, but I don't want you to be surprised at seeing them. And hit them over the head with a container of oatmeal? I think I can refrain myself. Good to know. I'll work on that personality trait myself. That's a relief. So I can come back downstairs and I don't have to look both ways before I walk into the kitchen? Probably not. Although I was thinking that oatmeal wasn't a very good choice. If I do this again, I need to use something a little more substantial, like a jar. Or a cast iron skillet. Lincoln offered helpfully. Then he grimaced. Why did I say that? Because everyone knows that two scars aren't enough. You need a third one. I don't think I'm guaranteed a scar with a cast iron skillet. But really, I'm fine with that lack. I think we can laugh about that. 
I promise I will not hit you over the head with a cast iron skillet tonight. So every day at the breakfast table, I'm going to have to say, will you promise me that you won't hit me over the head with a cast iron skillet today? Maybe, although breakfast is a long way from supper, and I probably shouldn't make any promises with that large of a time lapse in between. He shook his head, turned, having never set down the bag that he held in his hand, and walked out of the kitchen, oatmeal dripping from him. He probably didn't even realize that, and she didn't have the heart to tell him that he should brush himself off before he went upstairs. She'd been the idiot who thought oatmeal was a good idea, and who had bashed a person over the head with it before figuring out who they were. She deserved to have to clean up the mess. Chapter 3 the upstairs looked pretty much the same as what it had when Lincoln had left the house this spring, heading out on the harvest crew with his dad and brothers. Well, maybe there were different curtains in the windows, and the bathroom was a different color, but the room he stayed in was pretty much the same. The beds were made, the dresser bare, so he set his bag down in it, grabbed some shower things, and took a shower. Why hadn't Catherine told him she had sold the house? Of course, he could see his brothers talking her into not telling him, just because they thought it would be funny for him to walk in and be embarrassed. He was surprised the door had been unlocked. That should have been his clue. He'd gotten the key out from the lip of the rafter where they'd always kept it, but the door hadn't been locked. It was something that had gone through his head, but not a huge concern. This was Prairie Rose, after all and not exactly a hotbed of crime. At least, it didn't used to be. He shook his head. What were the odds that the woman that he'd already had one physical run-in with, actually the only woman in his life that he'd ever had a physical run-in with, would be the one who would be cracking him over the head with a container of oatmeal? Oatmeal! Someone needed to give her some pointers in common sense. Except, she was kind of cute. In a she's-cute-but-not-the-kind-of-girl-for-me kind of way. Unwrapping a mint that had taken the place of cigarettes in his life and sticking it in his mouth, he finished getting dressed and walked down the stairs. He'd checked the living rooms when he'd gone up, and both of the older folks had been sleeping like Annie had said but now both living rooms were dark and empty, although there was light and laughter coming from the kitchen. Light and laughter. That's what he wanted in his home, eventually, if he ever had one. He'd managed to make it into his thirties without finding someone he wanted to settle down with, but that was mostly his fault. The life he'd lived hadn't exactly been conducive to finding a girl. He figured he, along with most of his brothers, didn't want to subject their families to the life they'd had growing up. He loved it, but his mother hadn't. Walking into the kitchen, he looked around. Two elderly folks sat at the table, the ones he'd seen on his way up to take a shower, and they must have been the grandparents she talked about. Annie stood at the stove, stirring something that smelled delicious. I'm back, and you trained me to look both ways before I stepped in, so I think it's safe for me to be here. Is there anything I can do to help? She looked up from the pot, gave him a lifted brow, and shook her head. But she was grinning when she looked back down at the stove. She reached for the burner control and lowered it before setting the spoon down on the counter and turning to face him fully. These are my grandparents, Philip and Nancy. Graham and Pap. This is Lincoln Connolly. I think you probably know of him, even if you've never met him personally. Your dad has the harvest crew in the big garage outside of town? Pap asked thoughtfully, as though trying to remember if he might have heard that info somewhere. That's right. That's where we keep all of our stuff over the winter, unless we're off doing something else. What in the world else would you do in the winter? Philip asked, reaching out and grasping Lincoln's proffered hand shaking it while looking the younger man in the eye. 
Well, we've gone to South Africa, several years actually, and Dad and I are taking a trip to Argentina later this week. We'll be gone over Thanksgiving and are hoping to tour a few places that might be interested in hiring us. Won't it be expensive to ship your equipment down there? We're looking into that. We might set up a second company in South America. He shrugged his shoulders. It might turn out to be nothing. You never know. But the offer sounded interesting enough that it warranted taking a trip down to check it out. Philip nodded, and Annie made a sound of what he assumed to be interest before turning back to the stove. She was slender, child-sized almost. Young teen-sized, anyway. Her long blonde hair hung to her waist, and she wore a knee-length skirt with leggings and some kind of warm-looking boot with white cotton ball stuff sticking out the top of it. A cute outfit, he supposed. He didn't typically notice what women wore, but he noticed Annie. Odd. Then you'll be back to stay the winter? Nancy asked, looking at him almost suspiciously, like she'd noticed that he had been... Was he checking Annie out? He hadn't meant to, but her grandma almost looked like she was annoyed that he had been. He felt like he should apologize. He wasn't interested in Annie like that. He wasn't interested in her at all, other than she was letting him crash here, and he didn't have to find somewhere else to stay, which he appreciated, as tired as he was. Uh, yeah, I'll be spending the next three days working on getting the equipment winterized, and then Dad and I are taking off. But that's all we're doing when we get back. We have three combines that need to be torn down, parts replaced, and put back together before spring. Even one's a big job, but three will take most of the winter. Plus, there were some odds and ends, a corn head that needed to be rebuilt as well, and lots of maintenance done on the trucks and wagons. We don't do a whole lot of maintenance during the summer while we're working, but things add up, and the winter ends up being a big maintenance holiday. Oh, Nancy sat, and Lincoln kicked himself. She hadn't been the slightest bit interested in what he was going to be doing this winter, and she hadn't needed the rundown of the maintenance work they were doing on their equipment. You know how to do all that stuff? Annie said from behind him. He turned, looking at her, surprised that she had been listening. Yeah, we grew up doing it. I don't even really remember learning it. It's like walking. It's just something we always did. She sniffed. Mince? Yeah. He didn't say anything more, but then she surprised him again. You smelled like mint this summer, too. He knew exactly what she was talking about when he tackled her outside her brother's house. That's the only other time they'd ever seen each other close up. He nodded. It's a habit. I used to smoke. Now I eat. She lifted her chin and her brows twitched. Then she turned back to the stove, snapping the burner off and moving the last pan to a cold burner. You didn't answer me. Is there something I can do to help? You're giving me a place to stay for a few nights. I'd like to do something to earn my keep. And I see that the oatmeal mess is already cleaned up. Yeah, I figured I deserved that. And I actually swept it up the whole way up the stairs and through the hall while you were showering. Oh, I hadn't even considered. He finished lamely. He really hadn't. Sometimes his new stepmom gave his brothers and him a hard time for walking in the camper and bringing dirt in with them, but most of the time, he and his brothers were probably more clueless than they should be at making messes. He supposed it went with living without a mother or any female influences. I figured you didn't. It wasn't a problem. It was my fault there was oatmeal spilled anyway, Annie said casually, and she didn't seem perturbed that she had to clean up his mess. His stepmom sometimes got annoyed with them and accused them of having no manners. Her accusations were usually pretty accurate. Maybe he'd have to try a little harder for the next three days, because Annie seemed like the kind of girl who was slightly genteel and definitely cared about things like messes and manners and the men who made them. 
he didn't want her to get a bad impression about him, or at least think that he wasn't considerate. You never answered my question if there was anything I can do, he said again. Sure, you can set this on the table on top of this, she said, handing him a hot pad and indicating the pan that she'd just finished cooking. There was some kind of soup in it, and it smelled amazing. Opening the oven, she pulled out a loaf of bread. I would have made two if I'd realized you were coming, she said, setting the bread on the oven. It was a deep, rich, golden brown, and smelled even better than the soup. I'm sorry, I would have announced that I was coming if I'd known that there were going to be people here when I got here. They grinned at each other, not the easygoing grins of people who had known each other for years, but the somewhat reserved grins of people who were just getting to know each other, and who had started off on the wrong foot, but who were trying to make it so they were going forward on the right foot. At least, that's how he would describe it. Hopefully Annie felt the same. Hopefully she wasn't just putting up with him because she had to. He was a little afraid to ask about that. She set the sliced bread along with butter on the table, covered with a cloth to keep it warm, he supposed, before she sat down with them, and they all bowed their heads. Philip said grace before they all started to pass food. Without saying anything, they seemed to give him deference, passing him things first. He didn't take as much as he might have if he had been with his own family, because he didn't want to take more than his share and have anyone here go to bed hungry. But there seemed to be plenty, and when Annie noticed his bowl was empty, she encouraged him to take seconds, along with another piece of bread. He didn't turn that invitation down. I ran a combine more than once, since I used to own a farm a little west of here that just got raised to put in an airport but I've never seen the guts of one, Philip said, still on his first bowl of soup and seeming to be more interested in talking than eating. I find it interesting, but I understand not everyone does. I was kind of handy with a wrench, but we never had the tools necessary to do any of that more detailed work. If you'd like to come along tomorrow, you're welcome to. It might be a long day, but we have seats in the garage and there's always coffee. Usually I bring donuts and no one goes hungry. I wouldn't want to get in your way. I'm an old man, and I know how it is when you're trying to get a job done and someone's underfoot. You wouldn't be underfoot, and you wouldn't be in the way. But it's up to you. You're welcome to come. Out of the corner of his eye, he noticed that Annie's spoon had stopped halfway to her mouth. He wanted to look at her and see if his invitation had been welcome or if she'd been horrified that he had suggested such a thing. Reaching for the butter and glancing at her face, he was pretty sure she was grateful and excited. Who would have thought? Sometimes he had a tendency to talk about his work and people just didn't understand. They weren't interested. Ladies especially, he supposed. Which might be another reason he'd managed to make it into his thirties without being married. He had a tendency to talk more about himself than about others, and not be as concerned about the people who were supposed to be sharing the conversation. His brothers had teased him about that more than once, that his interests lay in food and in himself. He was working on it. A year ago, he probably wouldn't have thought to invite Philip to go with him, and he definitely wouldn't have thought to see what Annie thought about it. Maybe it wasn't exactly a complete turnaround, but he felt like he was growing a little and learning to focus on others rather than himself. Or, if not focus, at least think about. He had had the Bible verse, Do unto others as you would have them do unto you, etched on his thermos, which he carried around all summer. He even had a list in his Bible on one of the pages of the things he liked to have people do to him so he could be reminded to do those things to others. Listening was one of the things on the list. He'd been making a conscious effort to do all of the things that he liked to have people do to him to others. It had been slow going, and he couldn't always see any progress, but he was gradually getting better at it, 
and one of the benefits that he hadn't anticipated was that other people's happiness sparked his own. It used to be that he had been solely concerned about his own happiness and not as interested in others. So, Annie, Graham, do you think you guys can live without me for a day? Philip asked, and his voice held a little bit of self-deprecation, like he figured they wouldn't mind at all if he were out of their hair. When you retired, I look forward to being able to spend every single day with you, but I suppose if you are gone for one, I can manage, Nancy said, and her words made her husband's chest puff out and his eyes glow with happiness, but also with affection and almost idolization. It was unbelievable to Lincoln that people could be as married as long as these two must have been, and still look at each other like that. And she was still considerate of his feelings. She could have just said, yeah, go with my blessing, but she made sure he knew he was wanted. That was the kind of wife he wanted. But he couldn't want that kind of wife without becoming that kind of person himself. That would be selfish, and that's what he'd been working on. I'm with Graham, Pap. One day, yes, but I like having you around. It will be kind of quiet and lonely in here without you. Oh, Annie, sweetie, you always find something to do. She sure does, and I'm pretty sure that this week she was supposed to be cleaning Joe's and Ralph's houses. She should be able to live without you for a few days. <laughs> That's true. I do have jobs for the rest of the week so your absence wouldn't be too terribly difficult. For now, Annie said with a grin. They finished up supper, and Lincoln kind of hated to do it, but he excused himself to go upstairs and go to bed. If he hadn't been so tired, he would have really liked to stay down and spend more time with Annie. There was something compelling about her that made him want to be with her. Which was kind of weird but not something that worried him over much. They'd had such an inauspicious beginning that he figured if they managed to become friends, it would be pushing things. There would definitely be nothing more between them, ever. He was sure of it. Chapter 4 The next morning, Lincoln was up before the sun, typical for him. He'd always been a morning person, and with his early bedtime the night before, he'd been able to catch up on whatever sleep his body needed, and he was up at his normal time. The house was quiet and dark, so he crept downstairs on silent feet. He'd never developed a taste for coffee. He loved the smell, but couldn't stand it, even with tons of sugar and cream. There were times when they were working to beat the rain or some other kind of weather, or just because they were behind, and he needed coffee to stay awake, so he pretty much held his nose and downed it. But today wasn't one of those days, so he just grabbed a glass of water from the tap, didn't even bother with ice, and stood in front of the front door, looking out on the street, phone in hand with his Bible app up, drinking his water and slowly reading a verse at a time, thinking. There was no law that said a person had to be sitting down while they did their devotions, and he preferred to stand. Sometimes he paced. He didn't figure the Lord cared, as long as they were spending time together. That had been something else that had been instrumental in helping him to reach his goal of being more considerate to others and less selfish for himself. There was just something about reading the Bible that changed a person's brain. Made sense. If it was God's word, it would be powerful and capable of changing a man from the inside out. The older he got, the more he knew he needed changing. It wasn't too hard to look back on his life and see that most of the decisions he'd made had been based on what was best for him. Maybe once in a while he thought about what was best for his family. But he hadn't usually expanded that circle to include others the way God wanted him to. He was working on it. The stairs creaked behind him, reminding him that he wasn't alone. He turned to see Philip coming down. The ladies are stirring up there. Breakfast will be on the stove in a few minutes. I can get it started. I make pretty good eggs over easy. I know where the bacon is. 
and that's all you really need for a good breakfast. That and coffee. I can agree with you about the bacon. Coffee, I can do without. Philip gave a mock horrified look as he came to the bottom of the stairs. This younger generation don't know what's going to happen to them. The idea, no coffee. They shared a laugh as they walked to the kitchen together, with Lincoln turning on the lights. It wasn't hard to find a skillet and a little bit of butter, and pretty soon he had eggs cracked and frying in it, as Philip's bacon sizzled on the back burner. Annie really takes good care of us. It's been a while since I beat her down the stairs, and she usually doesn't let me cook breakfast. Is she going to be mad? Lincoln said, figuring that it was a little late now to be concerned about that. This summer, when he tackled her in the bushes and then ended up talking to her brother on the porch, her brother had said something along the lines of Annie never being upset. At the time, Lincoln had snorted and thought that Ferris had no clue what upset looked like if he thought his sister didn't get angry. But after having seen her last night, he thought that maybe that was true. He didn't give another thought as to whether she was going to have a negative reaction to breakfast almost being ready when she walked in the kitchen. In fact, he kind of looked forward to it. She hadn't had to give him a place to stay last night. In hindsight, he couldn't believe he took her up on it. It just showed how tired he was. I'm going to have to try to get out the door without my neighbors seeing me. Joe spends most of his days at the barber shop, but Craig is closed on Wednesdays, so Joe's going to be looking for something to do. That's fine. He can come, too. There are plenty of seats and plenty of company, Lincoln said easily, shoving the spatula under an egg and turning it carefully but quickly. His stepmother did most of the cooking for the crew now, but breakfast had been his job for two years straight after his mom had left and he'd gotten pretty good at making eggs. For some reason, he wanted these to be perfect. Maybe to show Annie that he wasn't totally worthless. He'd already admitted that food was his addiction, and he hadn't even added that he would be working on it in a little while. He was just so happy he'd been able to quit smoking. He hadn't worried too much about the food. But he had been packing on the pounds, and he supposed it was time over the winter to try to do something about that. No point in quitting smoking to keep himself from dying of lung cancer so that he could die of a heart attack instead. Plus, he still hadn't given up hope of finding someone, settling down with them, and having a couple of kids. He wouldn't mind that at all. Just needed to find someone who would put up with him. Or he needed to keep working on himself so he became a man who deserved someone who would put up with him. That was the second goal. The first goal was to live a life that pleased the Lord. He hadn't been too concerned about that throughout the first part of his life either, and God deserved better from him. Jesus said, If you love me, keep my commandments. He'd claimed to love Jesus since he was small, but he hadn't shown it in the way Jesus had commanded. That was a Bible app you had up, Philip said out of the blue. It was. I guess I don't do my devotions the way most people do. I prefer to be looking out a window if I can't be outside, and I typically do them standing up. Hadn't thought of that, but if that makes you comfortable, don't see why you can't. It did, but he'd already figured out it was okay. I suppose, on the go the way you are, most of the summer and in the spring and fall as well. You have to do them however you can. That's true. Dad was always adamant about taking us to church, wherever that was, and we went to a lot of places. We did some of the same farms year after year, which meant we went to the same churches. A lot of the deacons in those churches kind of took us under their wing, so to speak, since we were a group of ragtag boys with no mom. And if our schedule permitted, Dad took Sundays off. So sometimes we'd go fishing or just hang out with them. I suppose we got to see a lot of different Christian godly men in a lot of different places. Some of them have gone on to be with the Lord now, but those men are the reason that my brothers and I even do devotions. 
the reason that he had started trying harder to live a life pleasing to the Lord. Because all the things that he'd been taught in his youth had come floating back through his head at different times, reminding him of what he wanted to be, which was not what he was. I remember back when I was a kid, things were a lot different. We had tent revivals, hellfire and brimstone preachers, and a lot more rules we had to follow. Rules aren't bad. Never thought they were. Some people had a problem following them, but a lot of times, rules are just things that keep you from getting too close to an area where you shouldn't be. Lincoln took the spatula and gently lifted the eggs out of the skillet, flipping them over and putting them on a plate he'd grabbed from the cupboard. He put the next four eggs that he cracked into the skillet while Philip flipped the bacon. The kitchen smelled amazing, and he smiled as the steps creaked. Maybe it was Annie. Anyway, we've thrown away the rules because we don't want to be legalistic. But what we've also thrown away along with it is the idea that sin is bad, despicable, evil, and we should be ashamed of it. We just kind of blink at it now, accept it, and anyone who says anything, we just label them as intolerant and tell them they need to love people more. Love the sinner, hate the sin. It's so important that we give ourselves boundaries to keep ourselves from going there. After all, Jesus hated sin, and God is holy. Wow, I wasn't expecting to have a full-blown sermon this morning over breakfast, Annie said cheerfully as she walked into the kitchen. Her eyes were bright, her cheeks rosy, and her hair pulled up in a ponytail. With her small size and freshly scrubbed skin, she looked young. He figured she must be in her twenties, maybe even ten years younger than he was. She'd be looking for a young fellow, someone from her generation who loved the things she did. Not a fellow who started to look more and more like he was middle-aged. Lincoln looked down, his stomach not hindering him from cooking, but definitely keeping him from being able to see the oven door. That one was free, the one over breakfast you'll have to pay for. Oh. Well, maybe I can be the one giving it, so I can collect the money. Do we have offering plates around here? We emptied the sour cream container yesterday. Maybe we can pass that. Philip spoke while flipping the bacon. Annie looked a little guilty, and her eyes darted toward the garbage can. But she didn't say anything. Lincoln turned back to the stove, hiding his grin. He got the idea that Annie must have thrown the sour cream container away and she didn't want to admit that to her grandfather, who probably believed that a person shouldn't throw a perfectly good container with a lid in the garbage can. Is your grandmother on her way down? Philip asked as he forked the bacon out and put it on a plate that Annie handed him, covered with paper towels to absorb the grease. She is. As soon as I get done setting the table, I'm going to make sure she makes it down the stairs okay. You're always looking out for her, Philip said grabbing the last of the bacon and letting it drip for a little bit before he set it on the plate, and then slid the skillet carefully to the cool burner beside it. Your family? Why wouldn't I? Annie said, the clink of plates on the table accompanying her words. This really wasn't his conversation, but Lincoln jumped in anyway. There are lots of people who don't take care of their family, lots of people who aren't interested. It... It takes a certain kind of person to be willing to give up whatever it takes, their freedom, their privacy, their time, money, to take care of family. It's not something to just dismiss. Maybe he was reprimanding her a little, because he'd seen so many people who weren't willing to do what it took. He was one of those kinds of people. At least, used to be. He hoped he was growing out of that, but he wasn't entirely sure. A person's kids, it seemed like they had to take care of them. At least laws would force them into it. And governments would discipline them if they didn't. But a person's parents? Or their grandparents, even? No such law. No such expectations, even from society. From someone so young, he had to admire that she had been willing to make that sacrifice. No one answered him, and he thought maybe he'd said too much. He thought back over his words, making sure that he wasn't being selfish, wasn't talking about himself, 
wasn't focused on him and what he thought. Maybe they were just thinking about it, because he was pretty sure that he hadn't been going on about himself. That habit hadn't been completely broken, but he was doing better and paying attention to people's reactions and thinking about what he had just said and how it could have been better, could have been more focused on others. Annie walked out of the kitchen saying, I'll be right back with Graham. I think everything is ready, so don't let her hold us up. Eggs are hot and so is the bacon, Philip said as he set the plate of bacon on the stove and turned to the refrigerator, opening it and taking out orange juice. Lincoln carefully set the last eggs on the plate. He'd cooked a dozen. Hopefully that wasn't too many. He'd eat half of them himself, though, although he'd probably limit himself to three to begin with. At least, he'd try anyway. He was starving. Shoving a hand in his pocket, he pulled out a mint. Mornings and evenings were the worst for the old nicotine craving. He'd read that sometimes it never went away, and he was starting to believe it, because it had been nine months since he quit. Maybe it wasn't even the craving for nicotine as much as it was to have something to do with his hands and mouth, especially when he was nervous. But he wasn't nervous this morning. Was he? He had wanted to impress Annie. Maybe that was it. Nancy came into the kitchen, with Annie following behind her. Good morning, young man, Nancy said to him, smiling benevolently at him, making him feel almost like she truly was his grandmother, instead of a stranger that he'd just met yesterday. Funny how some people could make a person feel that way. Good morning to you. You're looking spry this morning and quite beautiful, he said, a twinkle in his eye and a smile on his face. She wasn't beautiful in a young lady Hollywood kind of way, but beautiful in the kind of way that she could make him feel like he'd stepped in and become a part of their family, just like that. Oh dear, we have a flirt among us, she said with mock horror. Watch it, mister, that's my wife. Philip said, but he was grinning as well. You better keep a hold of her. Some young fella might come around and snap her up if you don't appreciate her. Lincoln waited until they were seated before he sat in the same seat that he'd sat in last night. It happened to be at the head of the table while Philip sat at the other end, and the ladies sat across from each other along the sides. Annie sat in the same spot she had last night, at his left. Without saying anything, they all bowed their heads. Yesterday, Philip had started Grace without anyone saying anything, but this morning he said, Lincoln, would you like to say Grace? Lincoln felt like a great honor had been bestowed upon him. They were giving him the head of the table and now asking him to bless the food. Maybe he missed his brother's banter and teasing and joking just a little, but it wasn't enough to make him feel like he wasn't at home. I'd be honored to, he said. Bowing his head, he said a short prayer, being sure to thank God for the way that Annie and her grandparents had opened up their home to him, making him feel like a part of the family. Maybe he wanted them to know it, but he also wanted to make sure that he thanked the good Lord. He'd landed in places where it wasn't nearly as nice, where there was fighting and bickering, or even worse, where backhanded insults and cutting remarks seemed to permeate everything, and sour the air and make him wish he was anywhere else other than in that home. Yeah, he'd been in more than a few of those homes on Sunday afternoons after church. Sad, because they were supposed to be Christian homes. Probably being in those homes, and then seeing the godly influence of so many of the men who had chosen a different way, is what had made him decide to make sure he didn't go and become what he abhorred. The conversation flowed around the table in the same vein, some funny, some wise, some just giving information, but all of it uplifting and enjoyable. It was the kind of home he wanted to have eventually. His eyes kept tracking over to Annie. She deferred to her grandparents and was quick to smile. Not at him necessarily, but he was pretty sure their first two meetings were forgiven pretty sure. 
Chapter 5 Philip had not been joking that his neighbor was going to be watching for him to leave the house. They had barely gone out the door, closing it behind them, when an older gentleman poked his head out of his front door and hollered across the short distance between their porches. Where are you going so early, Philip? Told you so. Philip muttered as he shuffled to the steps and started going slowly down them, gripping the handrail. They hadn't had any snow yet this year, but overnight the temperatures had been dipping down below freezing, and anything that was wet would be icy. Go into the shop with this youngster, Philip hollered back, making Lincoln smile. He didn't mind being called a youngster, even if he was in his thirties. Reckon I'll tag along. Joe said without an invitation. Barbershop's closed today, and I'm looking for some entertainment. That okay with you? Philip said, muttering again and almost acting like he didn't want Joe to go, but Lincoln figured otherwise. The men might be gruff with each other, but he was pretty sure they were good friends. After all, old men tended to be pretty brash, but they didn't typically invite themselves along somewhere unless they really wanted to go. That's fine. I told you, we'll take as many of them as we can fit in the truck. I can even make two trips, if we really need to. He figured the old guys would have fun hanging out at the garage, checking out the new equipment they used, ooing and eyeing over the GPS and computerized layouts in the cab, all the while telling each other how the good old days were better. Welcome to come. No need to bring coffee. He said they had plenty there. Let me get my coat. Joe said, apparently forgetting he was in his bedroom slippers. Sure enough, he was out two minutes later, closing the door behind him, still wearing slippers. Lincoln debated about telling him about it, but then decided it didn't matter. His dad always insisted on keeping the garage clean, and the cement floor was maybe not clean enough to eat a meal on, but would be clean enough for slippers. Joe seemed to be able to get around okay, but Lincoln stood behind him as he got in the truck, making sure he was able to grab hold of the handles and make the steps. Philip didn't have any trouble either. Soon, both men were settled, and they were on their way to the shop. The fellows bickered back and forth, the way old men often did, as they drove out, and Lincoln was pretty sure it was going to be an interesting day. Certainly, he hadn't anticipated a day like today last night when he had walked into a house that he thought his sister owned. Now, in the cold light of day, he was embarrassed that he had walked into someone else's house and acted like it was his. Annie certainly had every right in the world to be smacking him over the head with things, for his brashness. Of course, he hadn't known. He pulled into the garage making sure the men got out okay and leading them over to the man door over along the side, since both of the big overhead doors were closed, most likely to keep the heat in. In the summer, they'd open up the garage doors on both ends, and wind would blow through, not quite as good as air conditioning, but better than stifling heat. Not that they spent much time at the garage in the summer, since they were usually out harvesting somewhere although their dad always seemed to be able to schedule a few days at home. Most years. It was how Lincoln had met Annie, because of the few days they had scheduled to harvest around Prairie Rose. Truman stood at the tool chest right beside the door, and he looked up as the old men walked in followed by Lincoln. His eyes rested on the men, not recognizing either of them, and his brows furrowed. They didn't usually get visitors not out like they were, surrounded by open fields. Truman, this is Philip and Joe. Philip is Annie's grandfather, and Annie is the lady who bought Catherine's house. Just like he figured, Truman, usually extremely serious and the least prone of the brothers to joking, couldn't keep his mouth from twitching up, and his eyes met Lincoln's. Oh, you met Annie? Technically, I met Annie this summer when I tackled her in the bushes in front of her brother's house. Yesterday, I walked into her house, thinking our sister still owned it. I suppose the little detail of the house sale slipped your mind? Lincoln said, knowing full well it hadn't. There had been a conspiracy against him created by his brothers, 
and he had to hand it to them. They'd done a great job of keeping the information to themselves. He wasn't going to begrudge them the laugh that they were surely looking for. Sure enough, Truman's face spread into a grin, while from somewhere further in, he could hear Franklin outright guffawing. Is that what I missed last night during my afternoon nap? Philip asked. Yep, Annie heard me walking in, and when I didn't yell out or anything, she grabbed a container of oatmeal, got up on that little step stool thing she has sitting in the kitchen, and whacked me over the head with it as I stepped in the kitchen. Franklin guffawed again, louder this time, and Truman outright laughed. Philip and Joe seemed to be trying to be polite, but were failing, as they seemed to chuckle under their breath. Scattered oatmeal all over the floor, and before I knew it, she had the step stool in her hand ready to brain me with it. You can't brain something that doesn't have any brain, Franklin hollered from wherever he was on the other side of some piece of equipment. I'll remember that if it ever happens to you and call it something else, Lincoln said, causing the old man to actually laugh this time. At least their loyalty seemed to be toward him. For now. That doesn't happen to be the same girl that broke your nose, is it? Truman asked, knowing full well it was. That was part of their joke, and probably why he'd been chosen to be the one to not have the information about the house sale. The one and only. I'd say you better marry that one, Joe said, laughing again. Philip didn't say anything, but the smile hadn't left his face, and Lincoln figured that was probably a good sign if, and that would have been a big if, he had actually been interested in Annie, in any kind of romantic sense. Philip might be okay with it. I guess if I have a death wish, that might be something I'll think about, Lincoln said. I'd say it sounds like you found one that knows how to handle you, Franklin called, finally coming out from around the front of the combine that was sitting in pieces on the garage floor. She had you figured out from the beginning. Lincoln decided he'd leave out the part where he suggested that she use the cast iron skillet the next time. The boys would really get a kick out of that one. No, Truman said, sounding thoughtful, even though there was still a ghost of the smile on his face. The question we need to ask for Lincoln is, can the woman cook? His brothers laughed, while Joe and Philip, who didn't know the addiction he'd adopted in place of his cigarettes, just looked a little confused, although the grin stayed on their faces. She can cook. She's the best cook I know, Philip defended his granddaughter. Although this fellow made breakfast this morning. That's his specialty, but he definitely needs a woman who can cook. Well, Annie's got the cooking thing down, although she's usually making us eat something that's healthy. Lots of vegetables, and she's kind of picky about her meat. There was bacon in the refrigerator for breakfast this morning, Lincoln felt compelled to point out. She makes an exception for bacon. I think pretty much everybody makes an exception for bacon. The men laughed, and Lincoln introduced Franklin, who had walked over and now shook the men's hands. They thought they'd hang out here for the day. They'd never seen the guts of a combine, and I'm guessing they've probably never seen the computerized interiors either. I used to have my own farm. For 50 years, I worked it. It sounded a little like Philip was bragging but Lincoln supposed after fifty years of hard manual labor, the man had earned the right to brag a little. I never did, but I did drive heavy equipment for a little while before I got a job at the parts store. Never really got to be in the cab of anything that I sold parts for, though. Talked to a lot of farmers then. <laughs> the good life, Joe said, looking around at the shop. His dad came out of the office then, and probably hadn't heard much of their conversation since the office was almost soundproof. Designed that way, because things could get pretty loud in the shop with the air guns and loud diesel motors running, which made it difficult to talk on the phone or do any kind of work. Lincoln made the introductions, and if he had had any qualms about bringing them, it would have been his dad he was concerned about. Sometimes his dad accused them of goofing off, like they were 12 instead of 30. But he seemed happy to see the men, and actually mentioned that he had a checkerboard in his office, 
and maybe he'd set up a table and use the torch to cut a barrel in half for chairs. After his dad had finished saying that, he looked at Lincoln like there was some kind of problem. Lincoln wanted to look down to make sure his shirt was buttoned up properly, but he didn't, and eventually his dad said, You forgot the donuts this morning? That made his brothers laugh. Actually, I had breakfast this morning, bacon and eggs, and they were pretty good. I guess I forgot all about the donuts. Sorry. He shrugged, knowing that it wouldn't be a hardship for someone to go grab something, if everyone had been depending on him for donuts and a little bemused that one day in Annie's house, and he already had a healthier breakfast than the one he usually had. People were always saying that a woman could do those kinds of things to a man, but he'd always assume they'd been talking about marriage, not about staying in a room, kind of accidentally. He also heard, and he believed it after seeing his stepmother with his dad, that the person that a man married could make a man a better person. The opposite also being true, that if he made a poor choice, the wrong wife could keep a man from being everything that God had created him to be. He supposed maybe it was a good thing he hadn't gotten married when he was younger, because he probably would have made a poor choice. Knowing what he knew now, he knew he wanted someone who would make him better, and he'd also come to the realization that in order to find someone like that, he needed to become better himself. After all, a wife could look at a husband the same way. A good husband had the potential to make her a better person than she ever could be by herself and encourage her to be more, or he could keep her from ever becoming anything. Sometimes, the way life worked out, a person only got one choice. He wanted to make sure he chose wisely. Somehow. When he thought that, Annie's face came to mind. Chapter 6 Dropping her grandma at the ladies' aid meeting at the church in town, Annie walked back on the sidewalk and stopped at Joe's house to clean it. He wasn't home, which wasn't a problem because she had his house key on her ring. It was, however, a problem for Ralph's house. Ralph lived directly beside Joe and usually hung out with Joe at the barbershop during the day. Ralph had noticed that Joe wasn't home and wanted Annie to tell him where he was. Since Annie didn't know, Ralph became more agitated, and Annie had a hard time placating him. Finally, she promised that she would ask Joe as soon as she saw him and let Ralph know what she found out. It was all she could do to settle him down before she left. Since she had a little bit of time before it was time to pick Graham up at the ladies' aid meeting, she walked on to the edge of town where the parts store was. The lady she'd bought her house from, Catherine, worked there with her husband. The odd thing about the parts store was that they had a pig that typically hung out in the store along with them. The pig was potty trained and was almost like a dog. Small towns were certainly unique, and Prairie Rose was more unique than most, she supposed. She'd never heard of a pig in any kind of store before, but Sally, which is what they had named the pig, was a favorite of customers, and sometimes parents would bring their children just so they could pet Sally, and in the last year, Sally had gotten big enough that smaller children had been able to ride her. It seemed like she would never stop growing. Annie opened the door, the bell jingling above her, and stepped inside. Sally was sleeping soundly over by the old pellet stove, which kept the side of the store where they kept the household items, crafts, and some decorations for the ladies nice and toasty. The pig didn't stir as Annie walked in, and it seemed to her that maybe the hog was slightly larger than it had been the last time she looked. Of course, that had been at least a month ago, and maybe it was just her imagination. There was no one behind the counter, but noises rang out from the back in the shop area indicating that repairs were going on, and the place wasn't deserted. Catherine stepped out of the back, the bulge of her stomach indicating that her time was close, and her adorable little son, Hugh, came out behind her. Annie, it's so good to see you, Catherine said, forgoing the counter 
coming around from behind it, her arms out. Annie loved that the town had welcomed her with open arms, treating her like she'd grown up here, instead of just moving there in July. It's good to see you, too. It's been a while. In fact, it's been so long that Sally looks like she's not just growing in length, but expanded around her torso. She should have. She's due about the same time I am. You're kidding. No, we thought maybe we'd give her a little bit more of a purpose in her life than just entertaining the customers. Catherine scrunched her mouth up a little. I know some pigs get very protective when they have babies, so I'm not sure how this is going to work out. Elias promised that he'd make her a farrowing pen before the piglets arrive. So far, well, you can see there is no pen. Annie grinned, looking over at Sally, who had raised her head at the sound of Catherine's voice, but hadn't bestirred herself to come over to get her ears and chin scratched. This is a busy time of year for him, with all the harvest and everything going on, and now people are coming in with their equipment, winterizing it and getting repairs that they've been putting off. I'm sure he's barely had time to breathe. Yes, that's exactly right, and I haven't been hard on him about it. I suppose if she has her little ones on the floor, we'll figure something out. But I just don't want anyone to get hurt, and while she's extremely tame and sweet, you just never know. I've heard pig bites can be pretty wicked, although we never had pigs on the farm growing up. I've never been around them either, so maybe that's why I'm a little bit more jittery. Malias is perfectly calm, but in my experience, men don't worry about things until it's too late. They laughed together, Annie having enough experience with men to be able to completely agree with that statement. I wasn't really in here to buy anything, but Graham has a little bit more time before I need to pick her up, and I thought I would just stop in and mention that your brother stopped in last night. Catherine's face was blank, and then she seemed to understand what Annie was hinting at, and a grin spread across it. Maybe a little sly. Lincoln? Yes, Lincoln, Annie said, irony in her tone. I suppose he was surprised to see you there and not me. Well, I think I was the one who was the most surprised, although I did surprise him, I suppose, when I broke the container of oatmeal over his head. That was before I almost smacked him in the face with my step stool. Catherine gasped, her hand going over her mouth, the other hand landing on her stomach, as though to protect her baby from the violence in the air. You're kidding, she said, sounding shocked, but also unable to keep the giggle out of her voice. I am not, and it would have been really awkward to break the man's nose a second time. I'll say, Lincoln's pretty easygoing, but that might have been a bit much for him. I'm sorry, I should have let you in on the secret, but I had no idea that he'd just walk in. I also thought that you usually keep the door locked up pretty tight, because of your grandparents. Normally I do, but I just carried the groceries in, and they were both sleeping and I hadn't gone out to lock it. Oh, my goodness. His brothers are going to die when they hear this. This is so much better than what they had been hoping for. So the information was kept from him on purpose? Oh, yeah. They had totally planned this. As soon as they heard it was you who had bought my house. You, who had already broken his nose, made him bleed, and apparently scarred his hands somehow. Catherine paused here, like Annie might fill in the story for her. Annie waved her hand, indicating it wasn't a big deal, even though it kind of was. Until she'd seen it, she'd had no idea that there was another human being walking around on the face of this earth with scars from her teeth on their body. Thinking about it that way, it was embarrassing. Anyway, when they heard that, they all conspired together to see if they couldn't throw you two together in some awkward way again. You know how men are, always looking out for some kind of practical joke they can play on someone. I guess, but my brother was never like that. No, you two have a great relationship and probably an unusual one, Catherine said, her voice lowering just a little, out of respect for the tragedy that Annie had lived through. Annie was over it 
Not that she didn't still miss her sister and her parents, but the accident that killed them had been years ago, and she'd made the decision that she wasn't going to sit around and mope. She was going to live her life and be happy with it. Most of the time when people mentioned it now, she didn't even care. Sometimes she had a little bit of sadness overcome her, but it wasn't going to be something that was going to affect her or determine how she felt or acted. Ferris has been a great brother. It sure looks like he has, and you must love him very much to have moved your entire house along with your grandparents here to Prairie Rose. I'm glad you did, Catherine added. By this time, Hugh, who had been holding on to his mother's leg while she talked to the strange lady, got brave and walked out from behind his mom and waddled over to Sally, where he sat, scratching her big head. Sally was used to it and stretched into him, careful not to knock him over. Annie watched. The little boy and the pig together were so sweet, and it stirred in her that familiar longing, the longing to have a child and a family of her own. She'd pretty much given that up when she agreed to take care of her grandparents 24-7. They weren't completely unable to take care of themselves, but they were becoming more and more forgetful and probably would have to be in an assisted care facility if she hadn't stepped in. More than once, she'd asked the Lord if she had given up her chance of having a family when she stepped in to take care of her grandparents. God had been silent on that, and she figured she just had to trust him. Knowing that what she was doing was the best thing, but also knowing that what she was doing might mean that she never had a chance to find a husband and have her own family. Not to mention, whatever man she found would have to be willing to live with her grandparents and take care of them. She wasn't going to leave them, because she knew the Lord wanted her taking care of them. It was the right thing to do. I wonder if Lincoln will admit what happened, Catherine said, her eyes on her son as well. I don't know. He didn't say, but I suppose if everyone worked that hard to keep that information from him, they deserve a laugh or two. I agree, and I hope you don't mind, but I'm going to have to make sure that they get it if I find out my brothers don't know the whole story. I don't mind at all. He pretty much made it through unscathed. I managed to recognize him before I hit him with the stool, and the oatmeal didn't really hurt. She put a hand on Catherine's arm. I have figured out that if you have an intruder in your house, oatmeal isn't the thing to grab. Catherine laughed and nodded her head. Isn't it crazy how when you're in the middle of an emergency, your brain just doesn't seem to function? Some people, and then some people seem to have this weird ability to do the exact right thing. That's not me, but I've seen it. She grunted. <laughs> Ferris has that ability. You're right. Some people do just seem to do the right thing no matter what, while the rest of us struggle and spend a lot of time wondering why in the world we did what we did. They laughed together. Then another customer came in, and Annie walked over to Sally and Hugh while Catherine went to wait on them. She knelt down while the little boy eyed her, his hand still moving over the pig, who was enjoying every second of his ministrations. Does she like to get her back scratched? She asked. Here, he said quite clearly and pointed to her stomach. Her mammary glance had started to develop, so Annie scratched carefully, not wanting to hurt her. The pig must weigh 500 pounds or more. She had no idea how to judge how much a pig would weigh, but she was huge, and all she would have to do would be to roll over and Hugh would be smashed. She thought he was pretty much out of the way, that he would be fine, but if she decided to bite someone, Catherine seemed to be okay with the pig, so Annie put the thought that the pig might be dangerous out of her head and just ran her fingers over her stomach, scratching lightly, enjoying the odd feel, the way the wiry hair brushed her hand, tickling, and made her smile. She had petted Sally several times before, but normally the pig walked over to her and nosed her leg, forcing her to lean over and give her a couple of scratches. This was the first time she'd petted her while she was lying down, 
and her stomach was much softer than the wiry hair on her back. My friend, you said, patting Sally's head with a good bit of force in Annie's consideration, but Sally seemed to enjoy it. It's nice to have a friend, Annie said, thinking about Catherine and Miss Matilda and Bridget and Krista, ladies she'd met at church and around town and who'd welcomed her to Prairie Rose. She appreciated what they'd done for her and tried to be a good friend back. Part of life was treating a person's friends well. She had figured that out when her mom and sister died. They'd found out who their real friends were, the people who made time to come, bring food, send condolences, or just be a shoulder when they needed it. Others had sent money and even come and helped with the farm work. Funeral expenses had been covered by an anonymous donor, and Annie always assumed that it was someone in the community, one of their friends. Up until that point, she had never considered the importance of friendship, but after that, she tried hard not to take her friends for granted, tried to be the best friend she could. Sure, she tried to do kind things for people she didn't know very well, but for those who had been in her life, those who had offered her kindness and generosity, she tried to make sure she reciprocated. No one wanted to be in a one-sided relationship, and she didn't want to be the kind of person who took without giving. She also didn't want to be the kind of person who took her true friends for granted. She straightened, smiling at Hugh, who looked at her and then snuggled down closer to Sally. She'd seen so many people been around them and watched as they sidled up to whoever seemed to be the main thing at the moment and neglected the people who had been around them forever. She caught herself doing that at times, too, wanting people who seemed important to notice and appreciate her, and even people who could give her things and do things for her, while taking the people who were always there for her for granted. Of course, she wanted to do kind things for strangers, but she wanted even more for her friends to know that she appreciated them. Looking again at the boy and his friend, she smiled. Even a two-year-old knew how to take care of his friend. Surely she could do the same. She waved at Catherine as she walked out, thinking that she probably had time to clean Miss Matilda's house before the lady's aid was finished. Miss Matilda hadn't specifically asked her to, but she'd done it several times before and knew the lady would appreciate it. It was a friend thing. She grinned. She wasn't going to scratch Miss Matilda's ears or pat her on the head, but she could go and scrub her kitchen floor. Her phone rang as she was walking up the sidewalk, and she pulled it out of her purse. Hello? Annie, I'm so glad you answered, Meg said. Would you have a few hours to watch the children tomorrow afternoon? I have to go for an appointment, and I just looked at my calendar and realized that it's at two o'clock instead of four, and I was going to have a teenager get off the bus with them, but I need someone before that for Missy. And then, if possible, I'll just have the rest of the kids get off the bus at your house. Sure, that'd be awesome. She meant it. She loved being able to spend time with her nieces and nephews. That was the main reason she'd wanted to move to Prairie Rose. Up until that point, she only got to see them sporadically, since they lived an hour away. I can drop Missy off on my way to my appointment, and I shouldn't be any later than five, although I can be earlier if you need me to be. But I wanted to pick some things up while I'm in town. Annie totally understood that. When a person lived as far away from town as what they did, they didn't waste a trip, but would combine errands. Not a problem. Jenny is a great cook, and she can help me with supper. Perfect. I appreciate it, Meg said, saying what time she'd be dropping Missy off, and then they hung up. Funny, but every single time she watched her nieces and nephews, Meg seemed to make sure that she got some kind of meat for her freezer or homemade canned goods. Often it was bacon, which Graham and Pap just absolutely loved. Annie liked to try to be a little more healthy, but she had to admit she enjoyed the bacon as well. 
It fit right into our thinking about friendship and how it should always be a two-way street and how she wanted to make sure that she was less concerned about impressing important people and more concerned about being a good friend. She turned into Miss Matilda's house and figured if she hurried, she might have time to wash the windows as well. Chapter 7 Lincoln pulled his pickup off the main street, parking along the sidewalk between Annie's house and Joe's. Thanks for taking me today, son. It was fun, Joe said as he reached for the handle with his gnarled fingers. I'm glad you came. I think my dad had a great time showing you around. But hang on a second. I'll come over and make sure you can get out okay. It's higher than you're used to. He half expected Joe to make some kind of gruff statement about how he could take care of himself, but he didn't. And while the door was wide open and Joe's foot was out, he hadn't tried to get out without Lincoln standing there. At Joe's age, a fall could be deadly. He seemed to understand that, and while he didn't like it, he took the proper precautions. The pickup door had no sooner closed behind them, though, when the neighbor on the other side of Joe's house hollered over from the front porch of his house. Where have you been all day? None of your business, Ralph. Joe shouted back against the wind, hunkered down inside his coat. Since the sun had gone down, the temperatures had dropped a lot, and Lincoln had to admit he was looking forward to going in the house. Not just because of the warmth and the food. Annie's face floated through his head her smile, her bright eyes, her graceful movements. Ralph harumphed, undeterred by Joe's brisk answer. You've been gone all day. I thought you were dead. I'm not dead. You can see it. It's a good thing I didn't plan your funeral then. Almost did. Ralph muttered, loud enough to be heard over the wind, but low enough to express his frustration. A fellow's allowed to get out once in a while. Maybe if you're nice to our new neighbor, he'll take you sometime, Joe said, giving Lincoln a snarky glance and a wink. You can come with me any time, Ralph. We spent the day at my dad's garage. Pretty cool to see how the equipment's been modernized. A lot different than it was when you and I were this fellow's age. That big garage on the south side of town? Ralph said thoughtfully, keeping his hand shoved in his coat pockets as another gust of icy wind blew down the street. That's the one. You going tomorrow? The barbershop will be open tomorrow. I'll be at the barbershop for the rest of the winter. Not every day I get to go check out a working garage with all this newfangled fancy equipment. He quit talking for a moment. And then, in a tone that said he really didn't care one way or the other, he said, Maybe you can come along. We'll see what exactly you learned today. I remember everything they told me. I can practically run it myself if I need to, Joe said, maybe bragging just a little. Lincoln hid his smile. They figured someday he and his brothers would be just like this, but it was kind of hard to imagine. I'll be leaving around six. If you want to come, you're welcome. Lincoln called over, standing at the bottom of the steps while Joe made his way up them. You have room for two? Joe said over his shoulder. Sure do. You know it. Count me in, then. I'll be there, Ralph said to Lincoln before he looked at Joe. Next time you're running off somewhere... Maybe think about telling your neighbor so he doesn't spend the day wondering if you're dead or not. With that said, he opened up his door, stepped in, and slammed it behind him. Lincoln bit back a smile as Joe muttered to himself while he opened his own door, then turned around, said another thank you, and gave a wave before he disappeared into his house as well. Shaking his head, Lincoln walked over to Annie's house. Philip was nowhere in sight, so instead of going in the front door, he cut through the yard and walked back along the house, figuring he'd go in the back door and take his boots off there. They weren't dirty or anything, but he figured it would be more polite. To his surprise, 
Beside the shed, there was a large stack of wood beside a big tree stump. He'd never been out back, which was odd, since he'd stayed there a lot with his sister, but he'd always spent his days working at the garage. But maybe that explained the wood stove in the kitchen. He'd always laughed at the idea of a wood stove in Iowa, but the previous owner must have had a big old oak tree cut down and intended to use the wood to warm the house except the wood was way too big to fit in the small stove that sat in the kitchen. It would all need to be split, at least in quarters and maybe more. They should have gotten a bigger stove. But he couldn't laugh too hard, because he'd made similar mistakes. Stepping up the back stairs, he walked in the little enclosed porch, taking his boots off and setting them by the kitchen door, and hanging his coat and hat up before walking in on stocking feet. The kitchen smelled amazing, and the thought went through his head that he wouldn't mind coming home to this every night. It smelled a little like roast beef, and sure enough, Annie looked over her shoulder as she pulled what looked like a round roast out of the crock pot. I thought I heard your truck out there, so just a couple of minutes until I make the gravy and we'll set it on the table. Let me wash my hands and I'll give you a hand. Just sit down and take it easy. You've been running around all day. How did things go with Joe? He was with you, wasn't he? Yeah, how'd you figure it out? Catherine called me this afternoon because she wanted to tell me how things went with you and your brothers and the joke they played on you. Joke? Yeah, you know, Catherine sold her house, but they conspired not to tell you. Oh. Yeah, I figured they deserved their laugh, as hard as they worked for it, so I didn't try to keep it from them. Catherine knew all about it, so when I was visiting her today at the parts store and told her about the oatmeal, she was eager to see if her brothers had heard it. I told them, Lincoln said, allowing a little brokenness in his voice, just acting a little like he was annoyed, although he wasn't. It was funny. He could laugh. Anyway, she mentioned that Joe was with you, and I had promised Ralph I would tell him if I heard what was going on with Joe. She walked over beside him at the sink, setting a bowl with a little bit of flour in it under the spigot and catching a small amount of water. She didn't measure it. Using the whisk, she mixed it in the bowl while she continued to talk. I had to call Ralph and tell him, because I promised him I'd let him know. She looked at him from under her brows. I'm guessing he was probably waiting on the front porch when you guys pulled in. He was. You called that. I figured. We've only been here four months, but Ralph and Joe are... typical men, I guess. They're both coming with me tomorrow. It might be interesting. She laughed. You're definitely going to need comfort food for supper tomorrow night. You know... You're letting me stay here. You're being kind enough by giving me a room. I'm not expecting you to feed me. I'm already cooking for Graham and Pab. I might as well make sure there's enough for another body at the table. Plus, I think they enjoy talking to you. I haven't seen Pab that animated in years. He was pretty excited to get in and talk to Graham about what all happened today. He didn't even wait for me. They're still in the room, chatting away. I know he'll come out and tell me about it at the table, and I figured I'd give them a little privacy. He dried his hands off on the towel that hung on the refrigerator door, and then walked to her side as she used the whisk to stir the broth that boiled in the pan. What can I do? She looked up at him, like she was startled that he was so close, and he probably had stopped a little closer than he needed to. Not deliberately. Just, he seemed to want to be closer, seemed to be pulled toward her. He couldn't recall ever being pulled toward someone before. The temptation to reach out and touch her, to put a hand on her neck, underneath that curtain of hair, to run his fingers down through it, to touch her waist and put his arm around her, was strong as well and just as unwelcome. He barely knew her. He fisted his hands and shoved them in his pockets to keep from being overcome with temptation. 
Funny, he didn't typically need to stop himself from touching people. The table needs to be set, and I made a salad earlier. It's in the refrigerator, and you can set that on after you take the plastic wrap off. Okay, he said easily. You were down at the parts store today. That's quite a walk. Did you drive? No, I have some houses I clean, and as long as it's not crazy cold out, the walk is good for me. Have you been in the parts store lately? Yeah, we typically stop in once or twice a week, and they bring stuff out as well. Why? I just didn't know if you knew that Sally was expecting a litter of piglets or not. She laughed a little as she poured the flour mixture into the boiling broth. It's been a while since I've been there, and it surprised me. I think it'll be fun, though. He grinned, thinking that piglets would be messy and not really fun. But he didn't want to rain on her parade and point out things that might spoil her daydream. If she wanted to imagine that a mama pig and her baby piglets would be all smiles and laughter, with no smells and poop, then he just wanted to enjoy her happiness and not ruin it. I hadn't realized. I bet little Hugh is going to like that. He seems to have a special affinity with the pig, which, I have to admit, concerns me as one of Hugh's doting uncles. And he laughed, and again the thought struck him that he wouldn't mind coming home to this. Warm kitchen, good food, pleasant company, and laughter. But Annie was obviously a town girl. Anyone who thought pigs in a parts store was a good idea hadn't been around pigs much. Not that that was a flaw on her part, but he highly doubted that her dreams would match his. And he wanted his own farm, sooner rather than later, if possible, although his dad was already reeling from Monroe and Jefferson leaving the harvest crew. He probably ought to spend at least another year on it before he quit as well. That would just about give him enough money to put a down payment on a place for himself. It'd be nice if a place around here would come up for sale. He'd been keeping an eye out. Annie turned the burner off and slid the pan she was working on to a different burner before grabbing the potatoes and bringing them over to the sink, pouring some water out of them. It was really nice of you to take Pap today. And Joe. That, that had to have made your day harder. But I know it made them happy. I'm sure that we'll be talking about it for a long time. I think they're all coming tomorrow. Ralph as well. They're not going to the barber shop? She asked, her eyes coming up and looking shocked. Guess not. He held his hands out before moving back to the table to take the plastic wrap off the top of the salad. That's almost unheard of. I don't know if Prairie Rose has ever seen a day where Ralph and Joe weren't at the barbershop from the time it opened until it closed. Maybe the garage is their new hangout, although it's pretty far for them to walk, so they need a ride every day. Annie laughed. Maybe that'll be my new job, because I can see them loving it. I can take them today and tomorrow, but after that, Dad and I are headed down to Argentina. My brothers will still be in the shop, but I won't be here to take them. He remembered something he wanted to talk to her about and stood with the plastic wrap in his hand, facing her as she put the tines on the mixer and cut butter up, putting it in the potatoes. If you don't mind, I'll stay here until I leave for Argentina. Dad, in keeping with the whole conspiracy thing against me, I think was having some of the rooms redone upstairs making them bigger and adding bathrooms on either end. With showers, which is nice, but it won't be done until spring, probably. Oh, that's where you were thinking you were going to stay? Annie said, holding the mixer poised above the potatoes as she looked at him. Yeah, it's okay, though. I can stay at a hotel, or I can probably even get Monroe to put me up. I think they have an extra bedroom. He lay the plastic down on the counter, figuring she'd want to cover it back up if there was any left. I'll have to talk to Graham and Pap, but we've got plenty of bedrooms here. You, you can stay if you want to. Her words didn't come out as confidently as everything else she had said. In fact, 
there was a little bit of wonder in them, like she couldn't quite believe she was saying it. No, I can't put you out like that. I appreciate you giving me these three days, but I'll work something out when I get back from Argentina. No, really. I guess maybe it's a little selfish on my part, but I'm thinking if you were here, you might take Pap to the garage once in a while with you. I'm pretty sure that as often as you'll take him, he'll be happy to go. Really? It's almost like you're trying to talk me into staying. I'm serious. He hasn't been that animated in a very long time. You just breathe new life into him. I mean, I don't want you to feel like you have to. And you're welcome to stay without taking him anywhere. The bedrooms are here and it's not like you're staying forever. She ended, switching the mixer on and effectively pausing their conversation. He never said he'd do it. And he had a bit of concern that if she knew he'd been here one day and had to shove his hands in his pocket so he didn't start fingering her hair, maybe she'd think a little harder before she offered to let him stay for the winter. He grunted, turning back to the table, grabbing some silverware. Chapter 8 They can combine a whole field, feet propped up on the dash, a cup of coffee in one hand, donut in the other. Pap said, shaking his head, the spoonful of potatoes that he held forgotten midair. Why, back when I was a kid, those of us who were wealthy enough to afford a tractor still had to work to drive it, and those of us who didn't used horses in our own back to get the crops in. My, how times have changed, he said, shaking his head again and glancing at the potatoes like he was surprised they were there. Then he put the spoon in his mouth. Everyone else had finished long ago, but he had been so busy talking he hadn't gotten done with the rest of them. I made a little dessert for us, Annie said, pushing back from the table and grabbing her plate before she took Graham's and Lincoln's. She ducked her head, because both her grandmother and Pap would know immediately that she normally did not make dessert. Neither one of them were supposed to eat much sugar, and she didn't really have a sweet tooth, but... Yeah, she was thinking of Lincoln and had made pumpkin cake with cream cheese icing. Maybe he wouldn't like it, but just the fact that she'd made it made her feel a little embarrassed, but also hopeful that he would enjoy it. She had no idea why she wanted to impress him. Was that what she was doing? Or she just wanted to do nice things for him? And she wasn't even sure why. Graham and Pap would want coffee with their cake, so she poured two cups and carried a coffee mug over in one hand while she carried the cake over with the other. Would you mind cutting it for us? She asked Lincoln. He nodded, a little surprised, maybe, that she had asked, but willing when she set it down in front of him. It's a pumpkin cake. It's Pap's favorite, and I had a little extra time today after I brought Graham home. I'm going to be watching Meg's kids tomorrow, so supper will be a little simpler. This smells amazing, Lincoln said, and Annie took Pap's plate, turning around and walking to the sink as quickly as she could, because she could feel her cheeks heating. Funny how three little words could do that to her. Three words from the right person. She hadn't thought he was the right person. There were no thoughts like that going through her head. So where the idea came from that he would be the one who could make her blush, she wasn't sure. Regardless, she could feel Graham's shrewd eyes on her, but Graham wouldn't say anything. Not in front of Lincoln. Although, she would definitely be suspicious now. They lingered over dessert, then Graham and Pap excused themselves to go sit in the living room for a while. I'll be in in a bit, Annie said even though it was customary for her to clear up the table and then come in. She said it more for Lincoln's sake, so he would know what she was doing. I can give you a hand with these, Lincoln said as Graham and Pap disappeared out of the kitchen. You don't need to. I'm sure you're probably looking forward to a shower and being able to relax for a little bit. Sounded like you had a busy day. I'm sure you're looking forward to the same. 
there was something in her that wanted to take care of him. She wasn't quite sure what it was, but she wanted to do the dishes and let him relax. Maybe because he'd taken such good care of Pap, she wanted to return the favor. Or maybe it was because of the same reason that three words from him could make her cheeks heat. She wasn't sure. But along with that desire to take care of him was the desire to be with him. Another odd thing that she didn't really have time to question nor examine. If you want, she finally said. I can't believe I'm practically begging you to be able to help clear up the table and do the dishes. I'm kind of surprised myself, she said. Is that because there's a certain way that everything has to be done and you don't like help? Or is it just because you're being polite and don't want your guests to have to work? I'm not sure. I was wondering that, too. I think I'm just grateful that you took care of Pap, and maybe that makes me want to take care of you in return. She hoped that wasn't too personal. That's interesting, because I kind of feel like I should be taking care of you, and I haven't quite figured out why. I guess I'm just grateful that you gave me a room and didn't greet me with a jar of honey and a stool today. <laughs> nice. So if I crack you over the head with something when you walk in the door, you won't fight me about doing the dishes? She stopped and tilted her head like she was truly considering the idea. You know there's that whole woodpile out back. You could grab one of those monstrous pieces and probably flatten me with it. I'll keep that in mind. If you get out of hand, I've got a backup plan. That might be a little bit better than the oatmeal. The oatmeal was a terrible idea. Are we going to stand here and talk about my complete inability to think under pressure? I thought we already hashed that out. It's a fun subject. I'm willing. Nice. How about we talk about you and your penchant for making assumptions that aren't true? Man, my dad and brothers already talked about that all day. Tired of hearing about it. She laughed. I bet it was a pretty miserable day for you. Catherine really got a big kick out of the story. Yeah, I think she would have shown up if she'd been able to get away from the shop. Everyone seemed to enjoy my complete discomfort, which is another reason we shouldn't be talking about it now. Fine, we can talk about it at supper tomorrow. I'll have kids, so it'll be much simpler, but is there anything you don't particularly care for? Not really. Soggy sandwiches? Cold coffee? Coffee in general, actually. You don't like coffee? No, never developed a taste for it, although I can swallow it if I have to, because it does a good job of keeping a person awake if they need it. Soggy sandwiches? She had a feeling that maybe there was a story behind that as well. Yeah, sometimes whoever's on dinner duty would make it before they walked out the door, Sometimes we just didn't have enough manpower to have someone at the camper making lunch for everyone. Tuna salad is particularly gross if it's in the bread, especially unrefrigerated, for six hours before you eat it. Okay, that could possibly ruin tuna salad for me. Yeah, when you're hungry, you eat it anyway. Just, if I have my druthers tomorrow for supper, I'd rather, if we have sandwiches, they not be soggy. Just a personal preference. Wow, we have so much in common. I don't like soggy sandwiches either. He laughed. I kind of feel like we probably have very little in common, but I think we're both on the right side of the law if we eschew soggy sandwiches. They worked together for a while in silence, with her rinsing the plates off and him loading the dishwasher. She figured if he stayed for any length of time, he wouldn't always help her with the dishes. She tried to tell her heart that one time of helping shouldn't have such a big effect on her affections. So how does someone like you end up taking care of your grandparents? He asked, in a casual tone like he was just making conversation. It was a sensitive subject, a little bit anyway, since she'd been told that she should have more ambition than what she did. Someone needed to. I was available, and so I did. 
That sounds simple, but surely there were things you wanted to do with your life and things you can't do because you have to be here with them. She put a plate under the spigot, letting it rinse off and shutting the water off before she answered. A lot of people think I should want to do more, and I guess they're right. I suppose there are things that I would like to do, but maybe because I lost my parents and a sister in a car accident. Her words were slow, and he interrupted her. I didn't realize. I'm sorry. It's okay. But whenever something like that happens to you, I guess that's an opportunity for you to learn things. She looked up at him, aware of their size difference since they were standing so close. Most people seemed big beside her, but Lincoln seemed even more so, maybe just because he had a deeper chest and because he did have a little overhang over his belt. He didn't look like an actor in a movie. He looked like a regular man, and that probably made him more attractive to her. I think pretty much every day is an opportunity to learn things, he said casually, taking the plate she held out and putting it in the dishwasher. Yeah, I agree, but not everybody has that kind of experience, where it's a huge tragedy and you question a lot of things. Okay, I'll give you that. I guess that's what I did when my mom left. Your mom left? Yeah, she walked out on my dad and the six of us kids. Never looked back. I've barely talked to her since, and it's been a decade or more. I don't keep track. But yeah, you can sit there and think about that and get pretty bitter about it. I imagine you could. My parents left, but they didn't have a choice. It would be a completely different story to have them just leave me. It is. Then maybe you understand. Maybe. Maybe I could learn something from you, though. I hardly think so, but I bet I know what you mean. You look at that and think about why. Why did that happen? Or why did it happen to me? And then you think, why not? Why shouldn't it have happened to me? Am I special? And then as part of the answer to the why question, you think you don't want this tragedy to go to waste. You don't want to not learn anything from it. You don't want to not become a better person because of that tragedy. You know, like you don't want their death to be in vain. Kind of like the Gettysburg Address. We here highly resolve that these dead should not have died in vain, he quoted. We had to memorize that in school. We did, too. You went to school? It's kind of the law in this country, he said, looking at her quizzically. I was just under the impression that you guys are always out on the harvest crew. I guess I thought you were homeschooled. Maybe in the spring and fall, when we stayed anywhere where Dad could enroll us, then he did. Although, a couple of years, maybe more than I'm thinking right now, I guess we were homeschooled. I did both. He shrugged it off like that was normal, and he didn't really think anything about it. She let it go, figuring that his schooling was his business. He didn't seem to want to talk about it much. It probably would have been hard, going in and out of school anyway. No structure or consistency to his childhood. So I decided that I was going to look at it as something that could teach me things, rather than a great tragedy that I wish hadn't happened because one makes me a better person. The second just makes me bitter and sad. You're pretty young, and that's wise for someone so young. You didn't think that? No, not at all. I was angry at my mom for a long time for leaving. I still don't even like her that much. But you love your parents, you know, even if they're not good ones. She wasn't a good mom before she left. No, I think she was. Pretty good, considering how Dad was. You know, never home. Always working. And she was alone a lot. I didn't really see that until I got older. I guess I wouldn't have seen that if we hadn't have had some godly men at the different churches we went to on the harvest crew. I was probably complaining about her one day, or just repeating something Dad had said about her, 
when they probed a little deeper and pointed out, you know, the things we don't see until someone else shows us. That's a good reason to have people who disagree with you in your circle of friends, right? They show you things that you can't see from the view that you have. Everybody has a slightly different view. We're foolish if we don't respect that and even encourage it. That's true. That's kind of what we're talking about, becoming better people, whether it's through tragedy or whether it's looking at things through someone else's eyes. I guess there's a reason you were talking about that, because somehow it led you to taking care of your grandparents? Yeah, I had already lost my mom and my dad, my sister. It makes you realize life is short. That maybe life isn't all about getting everything that you want, collecting stuff, pampering yourself, and making sure you give yourself everything you want. That's an egocentric view. Yeah, and that's a wasted life. He didn't say anything for a while, taking the next plate she handed him and putting it in without comment. They had the dishwasher loaded, and she was putting the soap in before he spoke. I hadn't really expected to learn anything this evening, but what you said rang some bells with me. His voice was soft, like it wasn't something he would admit in front of all of his brothers, but she appreciated him telling her. She huffed out a humorless laugh. I'm glad it made you think anyway. I know I've thought about it. Thought about being at the end of my life and looking back on it. And what do I want to see? Hours wasted in front of the TV? Not on your life. She shuddered. She didn't want to watch hours of TV or mindlessly entertain herself. Know the names of every movie ever made or the lyrics to all the popular songs. What good did that do? It just filled her brain up with junk and wasn't helpful to anyone. Didn't allow her to be a blessing to anyone. Was just wasted space in her head. Sometimes you have to relax, Lincoln said, casually, not defensively. He hadn't taken her words personally, and she hadn't meant them that way. What she did with her life was her choice. She wasn't trying to tell anyone else what they were doing was wrong. But the experiences she had had led to the conclusions that she'd been telling him. Life was precious. She didn't want to waste it on herself. I agree. I think there are some things you can do to relax, though, that aren't addicting. He laughed a little at that. <laughs> I'll give you that. It seems like anything you do anymore that has anything to do with pop culture, they're constantly trying to hook you, bring you back, make you spend more time with their product, whatever it is. That's right. It's all about making you want more. And I know I'm susceptible to that. I want to find out what happens, or I want that dopamine high again. And the other things I know I should be doing, like reading my Bible, or praying, or helping a neighbor, don't give me that drug-like feeling that entertainment does. Sounds like you have it figured out pretty well. It works for me. I don't preach that, though. It wouldn't be a popular message, for sure, he said with a laugh. I resented the time that my dad wouldn't allow us to watch TV on the Harvest Crew. We didn't even have one in our camper. And I was always hearing about things that were interesting that I wanted to do or see or watch, and I couldn't because we didn't have what everyone else had. But we did a lot of reading on rainy days and in the evening, and my dad was terrible at a lot of things, but he made us read our Bible. I suppose those two things, not having a TV and being encouraged to read my Bible every day, were two of the biggest influences in my childhood. She nodded. It's funny how our parents aren't perfect, but they do just enough to point us in the right direction. I never thought about it quite like that, but you're right. Sometimes it seemed my dad wasn't even thinking with the way he raised us, but like right now, I feel like he had an inordinate amount of wisdom too. How was that possible? That's probably the way your kids will feel about you. She said it kind of flippantly, but the words elicited that sad longing in her heart. And you... That's one of the sacrifices of watching my grandparents. I guess I really don't get out with people my age. 
she didn't want to say how long it had been since she'd been on a date. Actually, she could count on one hand the number of dates she'd been on in her life. Not sure dating is a good idea anyway, Lincoln said, maybe trying to make her feel better as he leaned against the counter, his arms over his chest, as she leaned against the sink. Chapter 9 The kitchen work was done. They could go. But Lincoln didn't seem inclined to walk out, and Annie was enjoying their conversation. She couldn't remember enjoying anything quite as much, but maybe what they were saying was the key. She didn't typically get to talk to people her own age, and definitely not in her own home, and usually not men. I suppose not. You don't really get to know someone very well if you only see them on Saturday night when they're all dressed up and on their best behavior. Bingo. You don't really see the real person at all. You need to work with someone in order to really know them. I can agree with that, she said after a moment of thinking. But not necessarily on the job. Like, you're not talking about dating co-workers. No. It could be on a church committee somewhere, on a school committee, around town somewhere. She almost said, washing dishes after supper with someone, but she didn't want him to get the wrong idea. He kept going, and she was glad he couldn't read her thoughts. Just where you brush shoulders in everyday life, that's where you get to see how someone really is, where they're not putting on their pretty veneer and you can see what they're truly like or what they believe, because people lie. Cynical. Truth. Agree. But when you watch them in action, their actions don't lie. So you watch what they do, and if it matches up with what they say, then you know they're real. That's smart. She figured she wouldn't go into the things a woman could do to snare a man and he didn't seem like that was something he was thinking about. She didn't know him well enough to warn him, and he seemed old enough to make his own decisions anyway. So you don't think someone would date you because you're watching your grandparents? I just don't have the opportunity to meet anyone. I hang out with old people, and I don't mind. They're interesting. They have great stories and lots of wisdom, but... Yeah, sometimes I wish I had a normal life, you know, where I had a job with people around me who were my age, and a regular social life. I suppose losing your parents and sister kind of put a wrench in that as well. You probably didn't feel like getting out much for a while after that. She was surprised at his perception, and his grin said that he was reading the look on her face and knew exactly what she was thinking. After they died, there was a lot more work for me to do on the farm, and then my grandparents and my brother and I needed to do a lot of shuffling. So, yeah, I guess that was the beginning of the end. Was it hard to lose it? He asked, and she knew exactly what he was referring to. His tone had been almost tender, like he couldn't imagine having what she had and losing it. Of course, she said. Losing their farm to eminent domain had not been easy. Losing the farm was easier than losing my parents and sister, although losing the lawsuit really stung. In ways I can't even exactly explain, I just felt violated, I guess. Like they legally stole something that wasn't theirs to take. That does stink, that you can steal legally and the courts are on your side and there's nothing anyone can do about it. That's true. There was a thump in the other room, like one of her grandparents tripped or something, but there was no yell, so she assumed that whatever happened wasn't an extreme emergency. Still, it made her look at her phone. My goodness, I didn't realize it was so close to bedtime, she said, shoving her phone back in her pocket and pushing away from the sink. He dropped his arms from his chest slowly, like he was reluctant to leave, and it made her heart warm to see it, to think about the idea that he might have enjoyed talking to her. 
Maybe she hadn't gotten to spend a lot of time with people her age. And maybe he was a good bit older than she. But the idea that she could be an engaging conversationalist to someone like him gave her confidence. Thanks again for supper. I have to admit I'm not used to eating such good food. And I'm definitely not used to walking into a kitchen that's warm and happy. Thank you. She had the feeling he wanted to say more, but he didn't. I'm going to run upstairs and take a shower. I'll be back down to check on your grandparents and take a walk around outside when I'm done. He walked out of the kitchen and down the hall, and she followed slowly, a bemused smile on her face. He didn't even live here, and he was going to be checking on her grandparents? Taking a walk around outside? She supposed to make sure everything was battened down, and the doors were all locked and the lights out, that nothing weird was going on. The kind of thing a husband might do before going upstairs and going to bed with his family. Not something someone who was just staying at her house for a few days might do. He never said whether he was going to take her up on the offer to stay after Thanksgiving. She hadn't even thought to ask. She supposed it didn't matter. She didn't need to know. Maybe he needed to think about it more, or maybe he just wanted to keep his options open in case he couldn't find a place. Whatever. She walked down the hall and stuck her head in the living room where her grandparents typically sat on either end of the couch, reading the newspaper or a book and sometimes watching TV. Tonight, Pap had his feet propped up, a magazine face down in his lap, his head resting on the back of the couch, his mouth wide open, and snores were coming out loud and long. Annie, her gram said in a soft whisper as soon as she saw her head pop in. I wanted to talk to you for a moment. She scooted around the edge of the coffee table. Annie backed out, her brows furrowed. What was the thumping? I'm sorry, that was me. I'd gotten up because I was thinking about Christmas decorations and I wanted to see if there was a plug somewhere below the big picture window where we could put the tree. I knocked the books off the coffee table on my way back. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to frighten you. She smiled, gratefulness coupled with affection on her face. I know how you worry about us. It's not worry. I just wanted to make sure I'm taking care of you. So, her grandma said, a sly grin on her face. I happened to notice that you and Lincoln spent a little extra time in the kitchen talking to each other. He's handsome, she said, her brows going up and down. It made Annie laugh. Her grandma was such a little girl at heart. She supposed all ladies were little girls at heart. Just some days they got up and looked in the mirror and wonder where that older lady's face came from, when they still felt so young inside. Her gram wouldn't be any different than her. Sometimes she couldn't believe she wasn't a teenager anymore, but an almost thirty-year-old stared back at her. Is he? Annie said, mostly wishing she could keep her thoughts to herself, although knowing her gram would want to know everything. Normally she didn't have any kind of romantic interest to tell anyone, and she found herself not wanting to share about this. But her gram was almost bubbling with excitement, and Annie couldn't deny her when she asked, What do you think? I mean, he's so polite. He is, Annie said, knowing her grandma was right. He had good table manners, and his language was grandma approved. He didn't have to apologize for almost saying things he shouldn't. She liked that, which said to her that he wasn't using language that he didn't typically use when he sat at their table, but was talking as he normally did. She did appreciate people who tried to tone their language down in front of her grandparents, but at the same time, she appreciated even more someone who could be real because that's the way they were all the time. That was definitely the kind of man she wanted, one who was real, and not one who had to put on a fakeness to impress her grandparents. Her gram's brows scrunched up a little. I suppose he's a little chunky. Annie smiled at her use of the word chunky. I guess that doesn't matter, not to me. 
I'd much rather have someone who has character than the long legs and six-pack abs of a romance novel. Someone raised you right, my child, her Graham said, smiling. Character is more important than looks any day. But it did help that he wasn't hard to look at. Philip and I were talking, and we were saying that maybe we should go to the church social tomorrow and leave you two here alone. It would almost be like a date. Maybe you can get to know each other a little better. He certainly seems like the kind of guy that you want to catch and keep. Did I hear something about a church social tomorrow? Lincoln said as he came down the stairs. Annie's face burned, almost the instant she heard his voice. If he'd heard about the church social, he had to have heard her Graham telling her that she should basically snatch him up and not let him get away. She couldn't disagree with her Graham, although she wasn't sure she knew him well enough to make a firm decision on that point. But she thought he was the kind of man she wouldn't mind getting to know a little better. She knew his family, and Catherine was a friend of hers. And so far, everything he'd done had been pretty much perfect. Taking Pap with him had been a huge thing in her eyes. Not just anyone would have done that. And then to pick up another old fella, and yet another one for tomorrow. But she didn't want to seem forward, and she didn't want to seem like she was chasing him. You sure did. Philip and I have decided to go, so you and Annie will be here by yourselves. I hope that's okay. Well, maybe Annie would like to go to the church social, too. If it's a couple's thing, I'd be happy to take you. He started the sentence out talking to her Graham and ended it by looking at her. Her stomach tightened and stretched and twisted, and then she remembered. I really can't. I already told Meg I'd watch her kids tomorrow. I'll have Missy from 1.30 or so on, and the rest of them will be getting off the bus here. Her Graham's face fell, like she was bitterly disappointed, which almost made Annie laugh. She was the one who should be bitterly disappointed. It is a couple's thing. It's one of those where you auction off people's baskets, and you eat with the person whose basket you buy. So you can't take kids? There'll be kids there, Graham said carelessly. But that wouldn't make for a very good date having a bunch of kids around. Her gaze became thoughtful, and she opened her mouth. Annie beat her to it. No, Graham, you cannot watch the kids. You can help me, if you want to, although I think it would be really good for you and Pap to get out and go to the social. The kids are my responsibility, and I'll keep them. I can stay and give her a hand, Graham, if that's okay. Unless you and Pap need someone to escort you there. It probably wouldn't hurt, Annie said. His gaze turned to Annie, and he seemed to want to say something. But maybe because of Graham standing there, he didn't. I'm going to shake him awake, and then I think we'll be heading to bed. Graham turned around and walked back into the room. If you don't want to go with me, if you don't want me around, just say so. I didn't mean to push myself on you. Although... He seemed to be warring with himself whether he wanted to say something, and she guessed that maybe he didn't like to feel vulnerable any more than she did. Although I had a good time talking to you in the kitchen, and when we're not attacking each other, I thought we get along pretty well. She had to laugh at that. <laughs> I guess today is kind of the first day that we spent around each other, and one of us hasn't tried to murder the other one. Nice. He laughed. I do think I like you better when you're not punching me in the nose, or biting me, or cracking me over the head with oatmeal. I don't want to throw all your sins up in your face. Hopefully someday we can have a conversation without bringing up mine, she said, laughter in her voice. <laughs> but... While we're on the subject, I have to say I like you better when you're not trying to throw me into the bushes, nor threatening me with the police. I did that, didn't I? He winced. You did. But if you find a teen throwing rocks at our windows when you go out tonight, 
I would appreciate it if you threaten them with the police. So I won't hold it against you if you don't hold the whole biting and nose-breaking thing against me. It's kind of hard to forget that kind of pain. Especially when it grew back crooked. You think it's grown? He sounded worried. She lifted her shoulder, like she really couldn't be sure. They smiled at each other for a moment, and the seconds ticked by into moments that strung together a little awkwardly. I... I can find something else to do tomorrow night. I can take a hint. He said, a little resignedly, like he'd tried and she'd rebuffed him, and he was backing off, not pushing her. No, I'm sorry. I wasn't trying to talk you out of it. No, it's okay. I get it. I look more like Santa Claus than I do a bodybuilder. He patted his stomach, a little self-consciously. And while I think ladies in general like the Santa Claus look, they don't necessarily want to date it. He lifted his shoulder like it didn't matter and made like he was going to walk into the room to see if Graham and Pap needed help. Stop, please, she said, trying to get her words to come out, needing him to listen to her, not wanting to say them to his back and not wanting him to leave thinking that there was anything wrong with him. Because there wasn't. I... I... She was struggling, and that didn't make it sound any better. So she said the first thing that came to mind, which was something a little crazy. I like the Santa Claus look. I wouldn't mind being married to it, and I would love to have you here with the kids tomorrow. That isn't a cop-out. I'd already promised Meg earlier that I would watch them, and I truly would like to see someone help Graham and Pap get there, but I don't want you to do that and stay there. I, like, please feel free to come back, and if you don't mind spending the evening with children, you can spend it with me, too. Her words came out in a rush, one on top of the other, words that came from her feelings more than her brain. They were wobbly and not eloquent at all but they seemed to get the point across, because he stopped, a hand on the door jam, and looked at her over his shoulder. Then that's what we'll do. I'll help Graham and Pap get there, then I'll come home, and I'll spend the time in between with you. I think I can help you watch the kids without too much trouble. Thank you. That sounds good. A little embarrassed at how ridiculous she had sounded, and a little unsure as to where this put them in the middle of their relationship, she nodded her head, saying, I'm gonna run up and get a shower. And she turned and fled up the stairs. Chapter 10 Because his dad and he were leaving in the morning to go to Argentina, his dad had wanted to get the corn head put back together and out of the way, so it was done and not sitting in pieces on the floor while they were gone. That meant that Melinda, Lincoln's stepmother, had to run the old man home at five o'clock, so Pap would have time to get showered and changed and ready for the social. It started at seven, and Lincoln had to leave the shop early, earning a frown from his dad, in order to be in front of the house at ten till seven. The church wasn't far down the road, but it was a cold night, and his truck was warm, so he figured he'd drive them. Graham and Pap were waiting for him, coming out the door as he pulled up to the sidewalk. He had them in it and delivered to the church with five minutes to spare. He wondered if Annie would be upset. He kind of thought she would be, just based on his experience with dates and ladies in general in the past. They weren't usually very understanding when his job ended up taking more time than expected. In fact, he'd had several girls break up with him because of that. Not that he and Annie were a couple. Yet. That's kind of how things were going in his head. That he and Annie might be good together. Definitely, he was interested. He had a little more trouble trying to figure out if she was. Although, after her statements in the hall last night, he thought maybe she was. She seemed embarrassed anyway, and maybe a little bit like she didn't want him to know, which made him pause. 
maybe she didn't like him that much, but she didn't want to hurt his feelings. He could never tell. Regardless, he drove back from the church, turning and parking so that he pointed toward it and would be able to hop in his truck to go pick them up. He went around back and came in the back door as he had the night before, taking his boots off and hanging his coat and hat up first. He could hear the kids and what sounded like possibly some motor sounds coming from the kitchen. Sure enough, when he walked in, Annie stood in front of the counter beside the stove, with a serious-looking little girl on one side of her and a more bubbly and smaller girl on the other side. Two boys stood on either side of the kitchen island, icing tubes in their hands, and it looked like they were decorating cookies. Well, looks like I'm a little late to the party. You're right on time, Annie said casually, no hint of irritation in her voice. Will I get an icing tube? He asked, walking to the sink and putting soap on his hands as he turned the water on. You'll have to talk to Matt and Robert about that. They're in charge of decorating the cookies. And we're in charge of making them, the little blonde girl said from her chair, turning around, almost losing her balance, and grabbing on to Annie to steady herself. Annie's hand came down, covered in flour, and she used her forearm to brace the little girl, helping her to regain her feet. Lincoln grinned as the expression on the little girl's face went from scared to happy again, totally putting the idea that she almost fell off her chair completely out of her mind and excited about the things that they were doing. The girls are going to get to decorate some cookies, and Matt and I got to make these. We just flipped jobs. Because I wanted to make cookies, and the boys were having all the fun. Because whoever gets to make them gets to eat them, too the little girl said, precocious and sweet. He could almost hear Annie's voice saying that exact thing, and the sweet little girl was probably parroting her. I see. So if someone comes late to the party, do they still get the taste test? He asked, sniffing the air and thinking that while the meat and potato smell was pretty good to walk into, cookies were almost better. I don't know. Did you get Graham and Pap to the church okay? Annie asked, biting her lip, like she was truly thinking about it. I did. Is the reward a cookie? What do you think, guys? Are we sharing these, or are these all our cookies? Annie asked, like she was actually going to let the kids eat all the cookies. If he knew Annie, she probably had about 15 people she was going to give cookie packages to tomorrow. He knew for a fact that she had cut off pieces of the cake she had made yesterday and delivered them to her neighbors this morning. I think we should share, the serious little girl on the other side of Annie said, glancing at Lincoln, then looking back toward the counter like she was shy. Annie's hands were covered in flour, with whatever they were doing, since he couldn't really see, but she leaned down, touching her forehead to the little girl's forehead, making the little girl look up and they shared a smile. That was new. Not a fist bump, more of a head bump. Maybe that was a thing with bakers. He wouldn't know. There are lots. I think he can have some. I think we have enough to give to everybody. Aunt Annie said that maybe if we were good, later we could box up some cookies and deliver them to people on our street. She said Mr. Joe is beside her, and these are his favorite kind of cookies. She said he likes a lot of icing, so I'm making his cookies. The younger boy looked up from his workstation, where Lincoln could see he wasn't lying. He did believe in a lot of icing. A lot. And he wasn't too concerned about whether the colors matched or whether they were even separate. I see. So Aunt Annie has children that she's supposed to be watching, but instead of watching them, she puts them to work? He couldn't help teasing her and he was gratified when her head lifted and her eyes shot to his. We're not working. This is fun. The little girl piped up from her chair. Annie smiled and gave her a forehead bump as well. She turned back around before she seemed to remember that maybe he didn't know everyone in the kitchen and said, This is Missy. She used her elbow to indicate the little girl, 
Then she used her other elbow to point toward the older girl on her right. And this is Jenny. Jenny is a whiz in the kitchen, and it's always fun when I get to cook with her. Jenny looked up with another shy smile, her eyes darting to Lincoln, as though to see what his reaction was, before they went back in front of her, and she ducked her head. The boys are Matt, who is the icing king, and Robert, who is quite an artist, actually. He created those over there. She nodded her head toward the far counter under the microwave, where Lincoln could see decorated cookies sat. He glanced at Robert again, judging him to be in elementary school, maybe third grade? He wasn't sure. He hung the towel that he dried his hands off on back up on the refrigerator and walked over to the cookies. You're right. Those are much too nice to eat. Although they look yummy, he said, a sincere compliment. The kid really did have an artistic gift. And kids, this is Mr. Lincoln. Remember I told you he'd be here? You said we'd have to stop and eat supper when he came. After our snack, because we were too hungry to wait, Missy said, and she seemed to be the spokesperson for the group. His sister Catherine had been the youngest of their family but he remembered her as being more quiet and reserved. Missy was adorable and seemed to be fearless. You don't have to stop in the middle of your cookie making. We're going to have to stop anyway, because Aunt Annie called Mom and asked if we could stay longer, and so Mom and Dad decided to go to the church social. They're going to pick us up on their way home. Whatever time they come, we have to be done. That's nice. You guys get to spend the evening making cookies. He supposed that Meg and Ferris hadn't complained too much when Annie had asked to keep the kids longer. He bit back a grin at the thought, although he was a little disappointed himself because he was leaving tomorrow and not coming back until after Thanksgiving. Ten days, and he kind of wanted to talk to Annie, see what she was thinking, and see if maybe when he came back, she might be interested in something more. It had been in his head all day, but obviously it wasn't something he was going to get to talk to her about, at least not until later tonight. Annie gave him a job of putting cookies on paper plates and covering them with plastic wrap while she washed her hands and made him a sandwich from the leftover roast beef from the night before. And it's not even soggy, she said as she handed him a plate with a sandwich and a steaming sweet potato beside it along with peas and a sliced-up apple. You're hired, he said immediately, noting the sandwich had plenty of meat in it. Either she was trying to get rid of the leftovers, or she really knew how to make a sandwich. He kind of thought it was the second. I'm sorry for not sitting down at the table, but I know the kids would like to get this finished tonight, and they've been looking forward to delivering the cookies. I want them to be able to do that. That's fine. Once I get my stomach to quit gnawing on my backbone, I'll give you a hand. With the cookies or with the kids? Either, both, or the deliveries, whatever. I have no plans for tonight. Don't you have to pack? Didn't you say you were leaving tomorrow? I probably should throw a load of clothes in the washer, he said, scrunching his brows down. He always traveled light and wasn't planning on tomorrow being any different. I hope you don't mind, but I washed your clothes today. They're folded in sitting on your bed. Her eyes looked a little concerned as the kids chatted around them. I would have texted you and asked if it was okay, but I didn't have your number, and I didn't want to ask Catherine for it. Her eyes dropped, and she looked at the spatula she held. I didn't want her to get the wrong idea, but I knew you were leaving, and I figured it would save you some time tonight. He wasn't sure what to say. He hadn't even considered asking her to do his laundry. Honestly, he hadn't thought of it himself. He typically didn't think about things until they were on him. Not stuff like that, anyway. What he wore was never a big concern. Well, I never even considered. I'm sorry, I overstepped, didn't I? She took his hesitation for disapproval or maybe irritation. No, 
I just, I'm just floored. I can't remember the last time someone did my laundry for me, and I appreciate it. Thank you. She nodded, seeming to be appeased by his words, realizing he was surprised and not angry as she had feared. The timer went off to indicate the cookies needed to come out of the oven, and she turned away. He went back to his supper, appreciating the fact that she even toasted the bread for him. It was the best roast beef sandwich he'd ever had, and even though he didn't particularly care for peas, he ate them all too, figuring she put them on his plate because they were good for him, and it showed a certain amount of caring, which he typically didn't receive from anyone either. His family let him eat whatever he wanted to. After all, he was an adult. It was courtesy, of course, but he could appreciate someone who cared. In fact, to his surprise, he wanted someone who cared. Even if that meant he had to eat something he didn't particularly care for. He finished his food, throwing his plate away and jumping into the work again. Time flew as the kids chattered, with even shy Jenny joining in the conversation eventually. Every once in a while, Annie and he would exchange a bit of conversation over the children's heads. He had to admit he liked that best. He'd wanted to spend the evening with her anyway. The kids were fun, though, and soon they had the cookies packed up and ready to deliver to the neighbors. It took longer than he would have imagined to get all the kids stuffed into their winter clothes, with each of them carefully carrying a plate of cookies in their hands. Annie had said he didn't need to come, and he probably should have stayed home, getting a shower and getting things ready to go for the morning, but he just wanted to be with her. He didn't question that over much figuring he'd have ten days to think about things and figure out if maybe he was being a little unreasonable. After all, Annie and he were pretty much opposites. Not just in physical appearance, but in their interests and their backgrounds, and he didn't even know what her plans were for her life, other than taking care of her grandparents. He had planned to farm since he was a kid and had been working toward that steadily almost driven to reach that goal. She just seemed to be floating and content with that. Or content with giving up what she needed to in order to do what she felt the Lord wanted her to. He had to admire that. Maybe he should spend some time thinking about that. Maybe he should add that to his list of things that he needed to improve. The kids had a good time talking to the people who came to the doors and several of the older folks invited them in, seeming to want to spend more time with them. Annie declined those invitations, and rightfully so, since they were just walking back from delivering the last plate when Ferris and Meg's vehicle pulled along the sidewalk. The kids ran to the car, begging to stay longer and asking if they could come again when that first request was denied. Lincoln could commiserate. That's exactly how he felt around Annie. He wanted more time. Walking to Ferris's side of the car, he shook hands as Ferris got out. Annie leaned down and called in the door across to Meg. Just stay where you are. The kids have everything they brought, and you don't need to get out. Just sit down. I really appreciate you watching them. And by the way, everything was good at my appointment. Meg's voice held humor. That's great. I wondered about that. How was the social? Annie asked. We left a little early, but there were a lot of people there. Looked like your grandparents were having a great time. I've been expecting them to text any minute, Annie said, glancing at Lincoln. He felt her eyes on him and looked over. I'll check as soon as I get this belt buckled, he said. Somehow, Missy had been next to the door where he stood, and he'd gotten roped into buckling her. It only took a couple of minutes until he figured the booster seat out and was able to straighten and grab his phone. They haven't texted yet. Maybe I'll just go ahead and start the truck and mosey on down once we have the kids taken care of. Annie smiled, relief in her eyes. He was glad he had offered. She cared about her grandparents, 
and while he didn't think she was worried, it was clear she was relieved they would be taken care of. He ignored his own personal disappointment. He'd hoped to spend some time with her. Although the kitchen hadn't been cleaned up, maybe he could volunteer to help with that. He and Ferris chatted for just a few minutes while Annie talked to Meg on the other side of the car. But they didn't linger long, and soon they had driven away, leaving Annie on one side where the car had been sitting and Lincoln on the other. That was fun, Lincoln said, surprised to note it was true. If anyone would have told him he would have a good time baking cookies with four kids, he would have laughed outright. I had a good time too. Thanks a lot for helping. It was nice of you to join in. I think that made it a lot more fun for the kids. He pulled a mint out of his pocket, sticking it in his mouth and grinning. Well, I have to admit that the idea of being able to eat the cookies was almost as enticing as hanging around you all. He spoke with a light tease in his voice, and she caught on immediately. Really? So I'm okay, but cookies are better. Got it. Hey, you know what they say about a man and his stomach, he said, patting his well-endowed said area. He might as well roll with it, because no one was going to look at him and think he didn't have one. I noticed you eat your vegetables. I noticed you gave them to me, he returned with a raised brow. That wasn't a hint. That was all we had. I, I just kind of expected you to throw yours away. I figured if you went to the trouble of making it, I could manage to eat it. She didn't seem to know what to say to that, so she didn't say anything. I'd better go. Your grandparents haven't texted, but I don't want them to think that it's a good idea for them to just go ahead and walk home because they don't want to bother anyone. Thank you. That's exactly what I was thinking when you said you would go get them. I can see them doing that. Maybe I'll see you when I get back? Maybe it showed how desperate he was, but he wanted to talk to her, alone preferably, before he left. Sure, I'll be in the kitchen cleaning up. I won't go to bed until Graham and Pap are in and settled. Good. He wanted to say more. Didn't want to walk away. Didn't want to leave her. But she started toward the house, and rather than watching her go like he wanted to, he walked toward his pickup. Chapter 11 Annie stood in the kitchen, looking around to make sure everything was still in place before she flipped the lights out. She'd lingered as long as she could. Graham and Pap had been in bed over an hour ago. Lincoln had brought them home, dropped them off, only getting out of his truck to help them to the house, and left again. Graham and Pap came in all smiles and happiness, and she was so grateful that they had gotten to go. They probably would have stayed home and not gone because of her, if it hadn't been for her watching the kids and Lincoln coming. Maybe Graham and Pap could get out more, but they stayed home because of not wanting her to be alone? The thought had been in the back of her head since they'd come home looking so happy. They also said that there had been a couple in the parking lot whose car wouldn't start, and Lincoln had gone back to give them a hand. That hadn't surprised her at all. She didn't know much about what Lincoln did on the harvest crew, but she'd heard enough from Catherine and other people talking that she knew when things broke, they fixed them themselves if they could. Jumping a car that wouldn't start would be a walk in the park for someone like Lincoln. It shouldn't have taken an hour. She looked at her phone again. More like an hour and 15 minutes. But who was counting? She left the doors unlocked and decided to go on up and take a shower. Maybe if she heard noises when she was done, she'd come back downstairs and look around. He'd specifically said he wanted to see her, so she assumed he meant it, but maybe he'd changed his mind. She'd never been one to take long showers, and twenty minutes later, she was showered and changed and standing in her room debating about whether she was going to go to bed or go back downstairs and check things one more time.
wondering if Lincoln had gotten sidetracked and maybe wasn't even coming home. Maybe he was talking to a girl he met while picking up her grandparents or while fixing the car. Women had a tendency to admire a man who was capable, and nothing said capable like fixing a vehicle. Especially in weather like this, she thought as the wind rattled the window panes, and she felt the cold sweep across the floor in her bare feet. She couldn't even text him, because she'd never gotten his number. Now she wished she had, because Graham and Pap got anxious if the doors weren't locked, and normally that was the one thing she went downstairs and checked, just so they'd know that she had done it. Going downstairs, she decided she'd lock the front door but leave the back one open, since normally Lincoln came in the back anyway. Surely he'd try it before he decided she'd locked him out. The idea that he might have found somewhere else to go tonight bothered her, but she pushed it aside. It was a ridiculous idea, because all of his things were here. In order for him to pack and leave in the morning, he needed to come back. Still, doubts were easy for her brain to conjure up, positive thoughts harder. She went downstairs, padded around, making sure the back door was open and the front door locked, when she heard his truck pull into the sidewalk, saw the red lights, and the hall bathed in yellow before the motor cut and the lights went out. Should she just stand here? She felt like he'd think she was waiting on him if she went to the kitchen and was just standing there when he walked in. Well, wasn't that what she was doing? Why would she act like she was doing something different? Because she didn't want to seem desperate. Like she was desperately waiting on him. Because, because she liked him, and her feelings went a little deeper than she wanted to admit. But she cared about him, too. Maybe she could just be waiting on him because she cared. Shaking her head at what a girl she was being, she padded down the hall and into the kitchen. It didn't matter why she was waiting. He said he wanted to see her, and so she was here. The footsteps on the back stairs were quick and hard and it didn't seem to take very long at all for him to move around in the back room before he walked in. His boots were off, and his hat and coat somewhere else as well. Although the door opened softly, it was quick. He had stepped in, and the door was almost closed behind him when he looked up and saw her in the middle of the kitchen, illuminated only by the light under the microwave. He paused, freezing in the act of closing the door, his eyes on her. I wasn't sure if you'd wait up, he finally said. You said you wanted me to, but I wasn't sure. I wasn't expecting you to be gone so long. I wasn't expecting it either. I suppose Graham and Pap told you that the Richardson's car wouldn't start? They did. I couldn't get it to jump either, and I ended up having to clean up the battery terminals and tighten a few loose wires before I got it going. I see. Yeah, I'm sorry. I was wondering if I could have your phone number. I would have texted you and let you know, but I couldn't. He smiled ruefully. That's not the first time I've wanted to be able to text you, and you don't have to if you don't want to. He ended, kind of lamely, when she didn't move right away. She moved forward, pulling her phone out of the yoga pants she wore and handing it to him after swiping it on and unlocking it. You can put your phone number in. One side of his mouth kicked up as he took her phone, his fingers brushing her hand. She didn't say anything, but she felt bad, because his hands were cold, and he was probably hungry again from being out. This close to him, she could smell the mint that he always seemed to be working on, because he'd quit smoking. She appreciated someone who had the grit to do something hard. Plus, she loved the mint scent. She didn't dwell on it and tried not to pay attention to the way the feel of his fingers lingered on her hand as she pulled it away. He held her phone, his thumbs going over the screen. His phone buzzed, and he handed hers back to her. I sent myself a text, so I have your number too. That's okay? Yeah, I wanted you to have it. He took a deep breath. Do you mind if I wash my hands and maybe we can sit down for a couple minutes? 
Sure. Are you hungry? I am, but I probably ought not to eat anything this late. I'll regret it in the morning when I'm trying to get ready to go. She wanted to say she would have packed for him, if she had known what he wanted to take. But that felt a little more personal than what their relationship strictly was. She'd already taken a chance by washing his clothes. She hadn't gone into his bedroom for them, since they'd been in the hamper in the bathroom. But she had gone in after she'd folded them, to put them on his bed. She felt a little bit like she was trespassing, but hadn't wanted them to lie around, especially with the kids coming. As he turned the water on, he looked at her over the sink. I wanted to say that I'll pay for my room. That way it's not like I'm just living here. She stared at him, understanding what he was saying and appreciating it. You know how small towns talk. Even though I think probably the story of me coming in and the oatmeal has made its rounds all over town, and everyone knows that I'm staying here because of your generosity and nothing else, I just wanted to make sure that we have that distinction, because... He didn't say anything else as he turned the water off and reached around to grab the towel from the refrigerator. You don't have to pay for your room. My brother bought the farm from Pap when Pap retired, and they have plenty of money. They've been paying me a salary, and they buy all the groceries and pay the bills. I bought the house out of money I'd saved, and I guess I'm just saying money isn't an issue. I don't need the rent money. I didn't think you did. He was over beside her now, having slipped over on stocking feet without making any noise. He stopped in front of her and looked down. Sometimes, people who were bigger than she was intimidated her, but his eyes felt comforting in a way she was hard-pressed to explain. She didn't back up. I, I was hoping to kind of blur the lines a little, and I wanted it to be clear that I was a renter here and nothing else. Her eyes narrowed. She wasn't exactly sure what he was trying to say. You want to make sure the town knows that you're just a renter? She said, disappointment making her chest hurt. She kind of thought that they were going to be talking about moving their relationship forward, not having him make sure he put the brakes on everything so that people wouldn't be talking about them. She'd waited up for this? She felt like a fool. She'd been having so much fun with him, enjoying their time together, thinking that he wanted to spend time with her and wasn't just doing it because it was what was going on at his rental place, thinking that of course he was kind and of course he would take her grandparents whether or not she was around, but thinking he was doing it because of her anyway. And he just asked for her phone number so that he would be able to get a hold of his rental person to make sure that the rental was going to be available the next time he wanted to stay. She'd made a lot of foolish assumptions. Fine. If you want to rent, that's fine. He blinked, as though something she said surprised him, and he seemed to struggle for a moment. I wasn't sure what a fair price would be. She shrugged her shoulders. I don't know. I've never thought of renting out a room. I suppose I could rent out the other ones as well. That would be a nice little side income. Thanks for the idea. Her words were deliberately casual, even careless. Maybe they showed how frustrated she was at herself for thinking that there had been more. Obviously, she'd been wrong. He named a figure, one she felt was more than generous for just a room and bathroom rights, not even his own private bath but just bathroom rights. That's fine. I suppose it'll be due on the beginning of the month. We can start in December if you're coming back here, or I guess you can figure out what one-tenth of that is and pay me for the three days that you stayed. She looked away, backing up slightly, needing some air, needing space, needing to escape so she could think about how stupid she was in private. Just leave the check or money or whatever on the counter. It's fine, I trust you with it. She faked a yawn, and unfortunately, she figured it was obviously fake, since she had zero practice in pretending to yawn. Still, she went with it. Oh, goodness, I'm tired. I hope you have a great trip. 
she said, turning and practically running down the hall. Annie? She didn't want to stop, but she also didn't want to be rude. She had her hand on the banister and one foot on the step when she said softly, Yeah, not wanting to wake her grandparents. I... She fought the urge to continue going up the stairs. She wasn't going to run from this, but she also wasn't going to stand here feeling dumb. She was done overestimating what was between them. Obviously, it had been all one-sided. I had a couple other things I wanted to say. I know it's late. Do you mind? He finally said, his face scrunched up like he truly thought she might refuse him. She had to admit the thought more than crossed her mind. It parked right on her forehead. But she couldn't deny him. Even though she felt like an idiot, she still liked him. Quite a lot. More than she should. Obviously more than he liked her. Sure. Can we walk into the living room so we don't wake your grandparents up? They take their hearing aids out, and they can't hear much of anything, but sure, she said, taking her foot off the step and taking a deep breath as well, squaring her shoulders, lifting her chin, and wrapping her pride around her like that proverbial cloak. She strode into the living room. Did I upset you? He said after she walked to the far side of the coffee table and turned, her arms across her chest. She didn't want to be standing toe-to-toe -to -toe with him, where she could smell the mint, feel the heat, and be tempted to move closer, as she had been in the kitchen. That would add insult to her already injured pride. No, she said, knowing it wasn't quite the truth, but feeling justified in saying it. She wasn't angry, if that's what upset meant. And she wasn't upset at him. She was upset at herself. You just seem not happy about the idea of me staying here. You can stay as long as you want to. I've already said that. I know, but sometimes people say things and they don't really mean them. They're just saying whatever they think the person they're talking to wants to hear. That's not the kind of person I am. I'm not going to say something that's not true, just because it's going to make someone happy. I didn't think that was the kind of person you are. He paused. I hope you don't think that's the kind of person I am. No, I don't. Then I suppose you know that when I asked for your number, it, it was because I really wanted it. I have to admit it was frustrating tonight when I couldn't get a hold of you, didn't know where you were. I knew you had wanted to see me. I'm glad you asked for it. Her words held no emotion. She squeezed her arms tighter across her chest. No, I, I wanted it because maybe I'm just imagining it, but I have a good time when I'm around you. I like walking into your kitchen. I like doing whatever you're doing. I was hoping that maybe we could be more than casual acquaintances, and that's why I asked to rent, because I didn't want the town thinking I was staying here and we were more, and then jumping to the wrong conclusions about what I'm doing here. She listened, trying to figure out exactly what he was saying, so she didn't jump to any more crazy conclusions, like there was more to their relationship than what there was but he seemed to be saying that very thing. My grandparents are here, she pointed out, feeling like that wasn't giving anything away. They're practically deaf when they take their hearing aids out to go to bed at night. He quoted her almost word for word. She allowed herself a little smile, still not feeling the greatest about her ability to judge what their conversations meant. That's true, but you renting a room doesn't change that. I know, but I just wanted that distinction there. Because I want there to be more between us, if that's something you're interested in, too. More? She asked, squeezing her arms for a completely different reason. Not wanting to give the hope that had sprung up in her heart a chance to get any bigger. Not until she knew exactly what he was saying. 
You know I have to go. Maybe I'll text you some, if it's okay, while I'm gone. And maybe when I come back, maybe you'd like to go out? On a date, she asked, clarification seeming necessary. Yeah, not that I think dating is a good idea. I just, I like spending time with you, and I want to spend more time with you. Not necessarily as friends, maybe friends and more. Oh. Friends and more. He wanted her phone number. He didn't want people to think he was staying here without paying for his room. Okay, maybe she hadn't jumped to a bunch of crazy conclusions. Not until she started thinking that she had, and then she really had. She was confusing herself now. So you're asking me out on a date? Yeah. I'm sorry to do that right before I'm leaving, and I'll be gone over Thanksgiving, which, at the time we planned this trip, it seemed fine, but now, now I kind of wish I wasn't going to be. Yeah, I guess that would stink. Yeah. He didn't add anything, and she didn't push for any more. A moment of silence passed, and he shifted. So, was that a yes? He asked uncertainly. Yes, and I'm sorry. I thought when you asked to rent the room that that was what you wanted to talk to me about, and I thought I was jumping to conclusions about some other things, namely our relationship, and I was frustrated with myself. That's why I was brusque, and that's probably why you thought I was upset. Although it was true I wasn't upset with you, I was annoyed at myself. Annoyed because you thought there was more than what I thought there was? He asked, humor lacing his tone for the first time in the conversation. She liked getting back to that casual, easygoing banter between them. I can make anything complicated, can I? Well, I don't know about anything, but you definitely can make hitting an intruder over the head slightly more complicated than it needs to be. And now I see you have a tendency to complicate our relationship as well. Our relationship? Yeah, I hope we have one. And I want you to know that, for me anyway, I'm not looking at anyone else. I haven't been looking for a long time, and that just seemed like something I wanted you to know before I left. Her eyes opened, and she understood why he felt it was so important to talk to her before he left. He wanted her to know that he wasn't going to be with anyone else while he was gone. That, in his mind, their relationship was exclusive, wherever it went, however it turned out. I already told you that I don't seem to hang out with people my age much, but maybe it would ease your mind to know that I'm not looking for anyone else either. It does. He'd been standing on one side of the coffee table, she on the other, but he stepped around coming closer. I find myself thinking about you at the oddest times. Your face goes through my brain. I think about your smile and how you make me laugh. I guess at first I wasn't used to feeling like that, so I didn't put too much credit in those thoughts. And then when I realized what I was doing, I didn't think you'd be interested in someone like me. He stopped in front of her, and his last words made her tilt her head looking up at him. Someone like you? Why wouldn't I be? He was perfect. He worked hard and had character, respected her grandparents, and was good with kids. He even helped out in the kitchen. You ate your vegetables, didn't you? She asked, smiling. He barked out a laugh, obviously not expecting her to say something like that. His laughter and his insecurity made her more confident than she might have been otherwise, and she took a half step, slipping her arms around his waist. He seemed to freeze, almost as though he wasn't sure what she would think, like he was nervous about her touching him. She tugged a little. That tug seemed to wake him up out of whatever trance he had been in, and his arms came around hers immediately, securely, holding her tight. She laid her head on his chest, 
the scent of mint surrounding her as much as his arms did. She felt protected and safe, and something else. A type of shimmering excitement in her chest. She wasn't sure what kind of name to put on it. She just knew it was comforting and disquieting at the same time. Emotions she didn't realize were possible to feel together. Something brushed the top of her head, like he'd leaned down, and his voice was close to her ear when he said, I take it this means since I ate my vegetables, you might be interested in me after all. Vegetables don't really have too much to do with it, although I do appreciate that. But yeah, I do. I am. I most definitely am. Chapter 12 Lincoln sat in the airplane seat with his dad, his phone in hand, flipping it over and over and over, thinking. He'd been gone ten days, and he thought about Annie just as much now as he had the day he left. Possibly more. He hadn't known whether she would be interested in updates from him. Did she want to know he got on the plane okay? Should he tell her that he arrived safely? Did she want an update on his day? They had never texted before, and he didn't want to bore her before he got a chance to win her. Bore her with the mundane details of traveling and agricultural meetings and long evenings spent in a hotel room with a book in front of him, but Annie on his mind. Did she like him well enough to want to know he was thinking about her? He'd been tempted every night to tell her that. And now, as their plane came in for the landing, he tried to figure out if she'd want to know, or if he should just show up at her house. Would she be upset that he hadn't texted her at all? What was the point in getting her number? They hadn't made any decisions and no promises other than that they weren't looking at anyone else. Maybe he'd get back and find she'd changed her mind, that she wanted someone who didn't think twice but gave her every detail of his day. He would have, happily, but he didn't want to come off as boring and uncaring. Plus, he didn't want to seem like he was hovering, because he wanted to know what she was doing, how she'd been that day, what she'd done, how she was feeling, and if she was thinking about him. He couldn't hardly ask those questions, though. She'd think that he was totally smitten with her. After ten days away, he kind of thought he was. The plane descended a little, hitting a small patch of turbulence, and his stomach shifted with it. You know, I think that could work. The partnership in Argentina with Diego? Yeah, I mean... I think one of us would need to be there through most of the season, but that would work out perfectly, because their off-season is the same as the big summer harvest in the States, and their main harvest season is the same as the off-season here. Someone could easily do both, although I do think it would be best to have someone there full-time. He and his dad had talked about it already, discussing the pros and cons, figuring out numbers and profit margins, and how they could make the logistics work. Lincoln felt his dad leaning toward accepting Diego's offer, which could prove to be very lucrative if the grain price held. Even if it went down, it wouldn't be expensive to build storage sheds in Argentina, much less so than in the States. I agree, he said, his mind only half on the project. Most of him was excited. Just a few more hours and he'd see Annie again. I need someone I can trust to head it up. Someone who isn't going to rob me blind and who isn't afraid to work either. Someone who can think on his feet and doesn't need me to make every decision for him. He listened to his dad with half an ear. They'd been through all this before. He'd thrown out some names as suggestions for someone to spearhead the project. That had been his dad's biggest stumbling point. His dad had struck down all the names, not wanting to trust an investment this big with just anyone. Truman would be perfect for this, Lincoln said, at least for the third time. 
Truman was the oldest and probably most like their dad, a workaholic, someone who never stopped. He could pretty much fix anything, and his impressive gut instincts led him to make the right decision almost every time. Melinda wants me to start pulling back from the business, and Truman is a logical choice to take it over. She says I work too much anyway. He shook his head, but the affection on his face was clear. He loved his wife, and she had a lot of influence over him, softening his rough edges, loving him unconditionally, but showing him how to have compassion and even affection for his children. Definitely, Melinda had been a good influence on his dad. Lincoln supposed that's the way marriages should work. Marry someone who makes you better. And then he got to spend the rest of his life with someone who would build him up rather than tear him down. Of course, it was a two-way street, and he didn't want to end up married to someone who made him better while he did all the taking. That was part of the reason for his list. Part of the reason for him working on becoming a better person, not just because God wanted it, although that was the biggest reason, but because when he felt the way he did about Annie, he wanted her to have the very best. If he were being honest, that wasn't him. He'd never been a good listener, never been very good at thinking of others first over himself, wasn't used to making decisions that put other people's welfare above his own, would make a terrible husband since he wasn't used to thinking of anyone aside from himself. Annie deserved better, someone who would listen to her, cared about her, would sacrifice for her without a thought for himself, would be more concerned about her happiness than his own. I think you would be the most logical choice, his dad said. Annie was probably getting up right about now, taking care of her grandparents, cooking breakfast. Maybe she'd be having bacon. Wait. What? He said, his phone slapping down on his lap, his head turning toward his dad, not paying attention to the snowy fields beneath them. Which had been a little bit of a shock as they'd come north, since he hadn't realized the states had gotten snow while he was gone. You're the one. Don't you get it? Why else did you think I brought you with me? I thought I was the only one whose schedule made it possible for me to go. He was the only one who had been willing to miss Thanksgiving with family, even though he regretted it now, not necessarily because he missed eating a meal with his family, but because he hadn't gotten to see Annie on Thanksgiving. He didn't even have any idea of what her day was like. Now that he was back home, he could clearly see that he should have erred on the side of caution, taken the risk at the same time, and texted her. He shouldn't have been worried about boring her or having only mundane things to talk about. Man, he was stupid. That's too big of a job for me, he said easily, taking a breath and relaxing. There was no way his dad was actually going to trust him with a project this big. He was investing to the tune of seven figures, and there were so many moving parts and pieces Lincoln had problems keeping track of them all. He dug in his pocket and pulled out another mint, unwrapping it and popping it in his mouth. Landing was his least favorite part of flying in an airplane, and for some reason with all that snow on the ground, it made him think of ice and cold temperatures and all the things that could go wrong. I don't think it is, and it's 100 times easier because your Spanish is the best Spanish in the family. He'd gone through a stage when he was a teenager of spending hours listening to Spanish radio and Spanish audios. He wasn't even sure why, but he'd been determined to immerse himself in the language and learning. It actually worked although his accent was pretty heavy, and he had trouble with verb tenses at times. Dad, even Franklin would be better. He always has the details covered. You know I have a tendency to gloss over the corners and estimate stuff. This isn't a project that can be estimated. Whoever did it was going to have to spend a lot of hours in front of the computer on spreadsheets, plugging numbers in and making sure things were balancing. 
it would involve a lot of airplane travel too, which he didn't mind. But maybe if his dad had said something a year ago or even a month ago, he would have been more interested. But he didn't want to leave the States. Annie was there. Would she be willing to move? She wouldn't want to leave her grandparents, and he wouldn't ask her to. There was just no way. Franklin's great with numbers, but a lot of this job is relationship building, and that's where Franklin and Truman both don't have your love of people and your easy way of making friends and chatting with folks. He hadn't realized his dad thought he made friends easily, or that he was good at small talk. His dad didn't seem like the kind of person to notice those things. Maybe Melinda had talked about it. He almost snorted. That was most likely it. Regardless, his dad did have a point. Truman and Franklin were both much more taciturn than he was. What do you say, son? You want to head this up? His dad looked over and grinned as the earth flew by beneath them and the plane got lower and lower. Man, Dad, I'm honored. Truly. And normally, I think I would jump on this. I might not feel like I could do it, but I'd want to try. But... Did he want to put all his eggs in the same basket and turn his dad down? What if Annie had changed her mind? He hadn't talked to her for ten days. He knew she wouldn't have someone else, because she told him she wouldn't. But maybe she was just biding her time, waiting to tell him that she decided that he was too big, that she didn't want to spend the rest of her life with someone who was liable to keel over from a heart attack at any minute, or that she was afraid that his size now was just an indicator of what he would become in twenty years. Or maybe she thought he was too old. He almost rolled his eyes at himself. He didn't even know how old she was. He'd never asked. It hadn't mattered. He liked her, and he didn't care if there was ten years between them. Was that how much it was? Maybe she decided that a decade was too much for them to have anything in common. If he would have texted her, he wouldn't be going through all these doomsday scenarios. But what? his dad prompted. But give me some time to think about it, please. That's a huge undertaking, and I just need to make sure that's the direction the Lord wants me to go. I'm honored, truly, but if that's not where the Lord's leading me, then I better not take it, even if I want to. His dad nodded, his face almost looking proud. That's a good answer, son. It's never good to jump into something without thinking about it first, praying about it more, being sure that this is truly the direction that the Lord wants you to go with your life. A fence flew past out the window, black-topped lanes, lights, and yellow dots, and the plane touched down, just a slight, feather-like touch on the runway before settling more fully. Lincoln's heart settled in his chest. That wasn't so bad. He didn't know what he had been nervous about. Then suddenly the plane jerked to the right, twisting, with such force that Lincoln was jerked toward his dad, smacking his shoulder into his dad's arm and almost cracking their heads together. The plane twisted and skidded, a screeching noise coming from the fuselage as people screamed and shouted. The lights went out. Lincoln put a hand on the seat ahead of him, his phone dropping to the floor as the plane seemed to find purchase again and tilted to the left, a ripping, tearing, grinding sound filling the fuselage with noise that could almost be felt and touched it was so loud and real. And then, just seconds later, it was over, and the plane lay still. Tilted to the point where Lincoln had to push with his hand to keep from falling over on his dad, his seatbelt digging into his legs. He didn't care. They'd survived. He sniffed. That had been his biggest fear. More so even than crashing into the ocean or into a mountain was to be trapped and unable to get out while the airplane burned around him. He'd rather die quickly. Maybe the intercom system was broken. Maybe that's why the captain didn't come on assuring everyone to not panic. 
Lincoln could almost feel the fear in the air. He couldn't be the only one who was thinking about fire and getting out. Out now. He had a feeling it could get ugly as people started moving, unbuckling, crawling over seats, calling out to each other in the dim interior. Lincoln had already taken his seatbelt off, was looking around, trying to figure out where the emergency exit was. Usually there was some place over a wing where it said right on the fuselage that it could be used as an exit in time of emergency. Someone had probably said during the emergency talk that no one ever paid attention to. He didn't know whether it was an emergency for everyone to get out, but he did know that if people felt like it was, other people might die as they got trampled to death. He found the writing on the side of the plane, two seats behind him on the other side, the side that was pointed toward the ground. They might actually be able to get out without a ladder or stairs. One man already pushed at the window. Let me through, Dad. I'm going to help this fellow open up this exit. Lincoln said. If the plane didn't burn, he'd be back for his phone. He swallowed the thought that it was going to be longer than what he thought before he got to see Annie again. Chapter 13 Annie woke up, unusually cold. Since Thanksgiving, they'd been forecasting a huge storm. Apparently, the computer models had originally said it would all be rain, and no one was too concerned about it. But then something in the upper atmosphere shifted, and cold Arctic air was mixing with the Pacific moisture that had come across the Rockies. The result was a huge blizzard, bigger than any blizzard she could remember in her 25 years. They were forecast to get more than three feet of snow. There hadn't been anything she could do about it. So she made sure her grandparents were tucked in like she always did, made sure the doors were locked, and went to bed. But the cold had woken her up. The cold, and thoughts of why Lincoln hadn't texted. Not a single text. Why had he asked for her phone number if he wasn't going to use it? She wasn't sure. He was supposed to come home yesterday but the snow had started yesterday afternoon, and it didn't surprise her that he hadn't shown up. Maybe he'd gone to his dad's garage for some odd reason. She didn't know, because he hadn't been in contact with her. At all. Hadn't they decided that they weren't going to see anyone else? Hadn't they said they cared about each other? And she imagined it all. It just seemed... Odd, after talking about their feelings, deciding they were only going to see each other, and exchanging phone numbers, she hadn't heard a word. Had he expected her to contact him? That just wasn't her way. She supposed, if she had to chase a guy, she was better off without him. Maybe that was old-fashioned, but she felt like that was the man's job, to do the chasing. Her cold feet brought her back to the present. Had the heat quit working? Had they run out of oil? Bracing herself against the cold, she threw the covers off, slid her feet into her sliders, and grabbed the sweatshirt that she had laid over the chair. Keeping her jammy pants on, she turned, glancing at her bedside clock to figure out what time it was. The clock wasn't there. She squinted in the dark, trying to find it. Had she been thrashing in the middle of the night and knocked it off? Instead of trying to grope around for it, she grabbed her phone and walked to the wall where she flipped on the light switch. Nothing. That's why she couldn't find the clock, because the lights were out. If her room was this cold, Graham and Pap's room would be too. Fear welled up in her chest. How was she going to keep them warm? Immediately, she started thinking about the blankets that they had in the house. Could she layer them on their beds? For how many days? Surely they wouldn't be fixing the electricity in the storm. And it was supposed to snow all day and into the night. And if they got the amount of snow that everyone was calling for, it would be days until everything was plowed out. 
She could hardly imagine Prairie Rose would be number one on anyone's list to clear out. They do the metropolitan areas first, the areas with the most people, and then gradually work out. The rural folks were always left to themselves, which nobody minded, because most of them took pride in their self-sufficiency and their willingness to help neighbors. Neighbors? What about Joe and Ralph? And Miss Matilda? All the folks that she took care of on a regular basis came to mind, and she almost laughed at herself. She didn't even know how she was going to keep herself and her grandparents warm. How could she do anything for anyone else? It kind of ran in her mind that Mr. Ralph might have a kerosene heater, which was rather dangerous to run in the house, but in a case like this, it was better than freezing to death. Maybe she could take her grandparents to his house. And then she thought of the wood stove. Of course! There was a huge pile of wood out back and a wood stove in her house. She could keep her grandparents warm. She could even help her neighbors. She could even cook. If they had to, they could melt snow for water. And perfect. Checking her phone, she turned the brightness down as low as she could, trying to conserve the battery for as long as possible, and then turned it off, setting it carefully on her dresser so she would know where it was while she groped around. She was going to have to split wood, because while there was a huge pile of wood outside, it was all too big for the wood stove. However, there was a splitting mall, and she had herself. She was young and strong. Surely she could manage to get pieces of wood that would fit in the wood stove out of the big billets that were out there. It probably wouldn't be easy, but she wouldn't quit working not if her grandparents' lives were at stake. The feed store had the pellet stove, and if she couldn't get her stove going, they could go to the feed store. Content with her backup plan and excited that she might have the ability to take care of her grandparents after all, she felt in her drawers until she had socks, leggings, jeans, and several layers of shirts and sweatshirts. She might not need them all if she were working outside, but it was cold out and she didn't want to have to come in and try to warm up, especially if it took her a while to get a fire going. Shoving her phone in her pocket, she went out the door and tried to walk carefully down the stairs. Normally her grandparents were up early, and today was no different. Annie, Graham said, meeting her at the top of the stairs where her doorway came off the hall. Graham, are you okay? It's cold in here. Did we run out of fuel? The lights are out. Oh, that makes sense. For some reason, I was just thinking the light burned out. No, I was a little confused, too. It's kind of hard to get your mind going in the direction it needs to go as soon as you wake up in the morning, when things aren't quite the way they should be. I know exactly what you mean. I think the older you get, the harder it gets. I'll take your word for it, she said, knowing that even though she felt much older than she had ten years ago, twenty-five was young to her gram. I'm going to go out and start chopping some wood. If we can get a fire going in the wood stove, we'll be able to keep ourselves warm. And then I'll run over and check on Mr. Ralph and Mr. Joe, and maybe even run up and see if Miss Matilda is doing okay. Your brain woke up pretty fast. I hadn't caught up to all of that stuff, but it sounds like a good idea. I'll maybe check the wood stove while you're out chopping wood and see if it needs to be cleaned out, or I don't know. It's been a long time since I've used a wood stove, but we used to have one when I was a little girl in Wisconsin, before we moved. That'd be great, because I hadn't even thought about how to run the thing. I guess I just thought you put fire in it and it burned and got warm. Her Graham chuckled. I think there might be a little bit of something to go along with that. I wonder when the last time the chimney was cleaned. When I bought the house, Catherine told me that she had it cleaned when she moved in. Even though she was planning on selling the wood stove, the owners had cleaned the chimney as part of their buyer's agreement. She never used the wood stove. That's good. We definitely don't want the house to catch on fire. I'm not sure the fire trucks would be able to get to us now. 
There must be at least 12 inches of snow out there. Maybe even more. She thought there was probably 10 when they went to bed last night. She couldn't imagine there would be any less than another 10 this morning. Her phone buzzed in her pocket, and she figured it was probably her brother checking on her. Smiling, hoping that his lights hadn't gone out, but figuring they probably had, she pulled her phone out. Did they have a backup source of heat on the farm? But it wasn't her brother's number that came up. Lincoln. Are you okay? A simple text after ten days of silence, but she couldn't be upset. How could she not love that his first thought was for her welfare? Maybe he'd heard that their lights had gone out. She wanted to know where he was, what he was doing, why he hadn't come home yesterday, and if he was coming today. Should she cook for him? Yes, the lights are out, but we have the wood stove. Is there wood? I'm going to split it now. It's down to 65 degrees in the house. I'll be there as soon as I can, but probably not until this afternoon. She wanted to ask where he was and what he was doing, but she just texted one word back. Okay. She wanted to ask when he'd get there, see if he changed his mind, if he decided after he left that he didn't want to be with her after all, or that they had been moving faster than he wanted to, or goodness, she didn't know. She didn't want to think about it either. Seeing him again would make things better, but if they were going to be together, she would be clear that if they were ever going to be separated like that again, she needed to have regular communication. When she went days with nothing, she started to doubt that he cared. Maybe it was just her, but she figured it was probably a universal thing, for women especially. That was why communication in a relationship was so important. And that was why making sure that the person you were with knew that you cared about them on a daily basis was just as important. She hoped he wasn't the kind of man who said it once and expected her to remember it for the rest of her life, with him saying, if anything changes, I'll let you know. Shoving those thoughts aside, knowing that that was something that she would just have to talk to him about, and she couldn't do it now, she shoved her feet in her boots and opened the door tried to open the door. She hadn't even considered that the snow would be so deep that she would barely be able to push the door open wide enough for her to squeeze out. First things first, she needed to shovel a few paths or they would be housebound, completely stuck until someone came to get them out. Glad she'd been woken up by the cold and thinking maybe it was more the Lord than anything else, she went to the shed, saw the splitting mall sitting in the corner, but grabbed the snow shovel to begin with. It took an hour for her to clear off the steps and go around and shovel off the front steps as well. By then, she was sweating underneath her sweatshirt and could feel the trickles dribbling down between her shoulder blades. Not wanting to take any of her clothes off, because she figured she'd get cold with the way the wind occasionally blasted down the street, she ignored the perspiration and took the shovel back to the shed. Tempted to walk in the house and check on Graham and Pap, she refrained, eager to see if she would be able to get some wood for a fire. If not, she didn't want to waste any time in bundling Graham and Pap up and walking down to the feed store. She texted Catherine first just to be sure, but she was almost positive they'd open the store up so people could come in and get warm around the pellet stove. It would be easier for her grandparents to walk there in two feet of snow rather than three. Grabbing a piece of wood that looked like it would be small enough if she only split it in quarters, she set it on its end, needing several tries and finally twisting it down into the snow to get it to stand. The splitting mall felt awkward in her hand, and indeed, it bounced off the first time she brought it down on the billet. The second hit wasn't much better. There was definitely an angle she needed to work on with the splitting mall and she figured her wrist could probably use some strengthening as well, since the mall seemed to glance off and twist. If she were a little stronger, maybe she could keep it from twisting, 
or glancing off at all. Regardless, she didn't give up because she wanted to be able to build a fire so her grandparents could stay in their house, where their medications were, where they were comfortable, where they were surrounded by familiar people. Plus, the entire town couldn't fit in the parts store, so if she could create a spot that could house a few, it would take some of the burden off. Her determination paid off, and in 30 minutes or so, she had two pieces of wood split into quarters. Eight pieces, and she was pretty sure they would all fit in the stove. Now that she had something she could actually use to try to build a fire, she was eager to see, gathering up the pieces and carrying them down the narrow path she'd made to the house. She stomped as much snow off her boots as she could and also set the pieces of wood down, smacking them together to get the snow to fall off those as well. She'd never built a fire in her life, but she knew that the wood had to be dry, or at least mostly dry, that water put fires out, and she didn't want any more water inside than she could help. Leaving six pieces outside, she carried two in. Graham and Pap were sitting at the kitchen table, bundled up in what looked like every stitch of clothing they had. Graham looked up at her, and her face relaxed almost immediately with relief as she saw Annie, carrying two pieces of wood. I was beginning to be afraid that you weren't going to be able to do it. I've been thinking that very thought myself for the last half hour or so. I've never split wood before, and there's a bit of a learning curve. I suppose necessity made that learning curve a little easier to climb, Pap said, and even though he seemed to be trying to hide it, she could hear the shivering in his voice. Pulling her gloves off and throwing them on the counter, she carried the two small pieces of wood over to the stove, heedless of the snow she tracked across the kitchen. Do either of you have any suggestions for me? She asked, joking a little, but Graham had said that she'd used a wood stove before. I put some balled up paper in the bottom, and I know you need to light that first. She paused, and Annie got the impression that she had something else she wanted to say but wasn't sure. Anything else? Annie prompted. Were there any little pieces of wood that fell off? I seem to recall my dad using paper and then small pieces of wood on top of that, and then he put the bigger pieces on. I'm not sure that the big wood will catch with just paper. I can run out and grab some, Annie said, laying the wood down on the floor and telling herself that she would clean the kitchen just as soon as the lights came back on. Her mom would have had a fit to see all the dirt she tracked in along with the snow but sometimes there were things that were more important than keeping the house clean, like surviving. She ran out, grabbing some little pieces that had flown off as she had been chopping, and wondering if maybe she should chop a piece of wood, on purpose, into small pieces. Figuring she could do that if this didn't work, she gathered up every piece she could find and stopped again on the porch, shaking as much snow off of them as she could. Normally, she would have taken some time to enjoy watching the snow come down, listening to it, hearing that special sound that warmed her heart and gave her soul peace. There wasn't anything too much better in the world than watching and listening to snow come down. But she didn't have time right now. She needed to get Graham and Pap warm. Once she had a fire going, once she had checked on the neighbors, once she knew that the people she loved were going to be okay, and she had done everything she could with everything she had, then, then, she'd enjoy the snow. Determined to get this fire going, whatever it took, she shook the snow off her boots and walked in the house. Chapter 14 Lincoln wished the skid loader had a higher speed. It seemed to take forever to get from his dad's garage to Prairie Rose, even though it was only a few miles. Annie had said she was okay, but she had no heat. Her grandparents would be freezing, and if she couldn't get a fire going, she would be cold as well. Starting fires was not exactly something he was skilled at, but he felt driven to go help her however he could. 
he'd already been in contact with Catherine, who had said that the pellet stove was going at the parts store, and there were at least 50 people keeping warm there. They'd moved the shelving back, putting the merchandise in boxes, shoving things out of the way, bringing seats in, and basically rearranging everything. Too bad the fire hall didn't have a generator. It was one of the things the ladies were raising money for, but it hadn't happened yet. It had a much larger area and could accommodate more people, not to mention they already had tables and chairs. That would almost be like a party. Regardless, Catherine had said that Annie wasn't there and she hadn't heard from her. He should have asked Catherine and Monroe to keep an eye on Annie while he was gone. Or, dummy, you could have texted her yourself. Man, he'd been working so hard on trying to pay attention to other people, not dominate the conversation, not talk just about himself, but to ask questions that showed he cared about people, that he had been overly sensitive to boring her with his texts and comments about his trip. He could have texted her with questions about her. Water under the bridge now. It was just a big mistake that he needed to apologize for. If she still wanted anything to do with him. The roads hadn't been plowed for hours, with the plow trucks probably focusing on interstates and heavily traveled areas. Technically, he didn't think that normal people were supposed to be doing anything to state roads during snowstorms but three feet of snow was an awful lot, and it was going to take everything everyone had to get them moved out from underneath it. Even two feet of snow could shut things down for a while. His brothers had been taking their pickups on the road, trying to keep the path from the garage to Prairie Rose open at least, and Main Street and Prairie Rose accessible as well. At least when crews came to fix the electricity, they'd be able to get in but snow had been piling up on sidewalks and everywhere, and when his dad and he had gotten to the garage late last night, after all the kerfuffle with the airplane accident, they'd had to fix the skid loader before he could take it to Prairie Rose to help get rid of some of the snow. His dad would be driving a dump truck in as soon as his brothers made another pass with the plows. He'd have time to check on Catherine and stop and see Annie. He'd see Annie first, but the parts store was on the way, and he could hardly drive right by his sister without making sure she was okay. A gust of snow swirled around him, making it impossible to see anything, and he did his best to keep the skid loader pointed straight ahead, waiting out the swirls until the whiteout cleared, and he could see that he was still on the road, following the trail of plowed snow. What felt like an eternity later, but was only twenty minutes or so, he pulled into the parking lot at the parts store. His brothers had obviously been making sure the parking lot stayed cleared out, even though there weren't any cars. Most of the people there were probably people from town, since, as far as he knew, the lights were off everywhere. He ran in quickly, seeing there were indeed a lot of people, with his sister stirring a huge pot of something on the stove, and he assumed she intended to try to feed everyone. After chatting with Monroe for a bit, asking about some of the farmers who were out of town, seeing if anyone had heard anything, he hurried back out. He caught Catherine's eye, and while she seemed a little concerned, she was also grinning. She knew exactly where he was going. He wondered if Annie had said anything to Catherine. He knew they were friends. Regardless, he was back in the skid loader and motoring down the street stopping in front of Annie's house, finally, after what felt like years apart. He just hoped he wasn't the only one who felt that way. Someone had shoveled off her steps, although there were a couple of inches of snow on them, so it had been a while ago. There was also a path from the front to the back of the house, narrow, barely a shovel width wide. It looked like she had dug through at least two feet of snow. The storm was supposed to stop by mid-afternoon, last he'd heard, so hopefully they'd be seeing the worst of it soon. He heard the chopping before he saw her, the ringing of the splitting maul on wood, an unfamiliar sound, 
And then he saw Annie, bulky and lots of layers, but still tiny, hefting the mall, which seemed like it was more than half as big as she was, and bringing it down with everything she had, her knees bent, her body straining, her arms pulling for all they were worth. The sharp edge stuck in the wood, and like she'd done it a million times, she moved it up and down until it came loose. It looked like she was an old pro at splitting wood, but he was fairly certain she'd never done it before. The maul came loose, and she let it swing past her in one motion, then swung it up behind her head and brought it down again. This time it went a little deeper, but still the wood didn't split. He watched one more time, and then again. Finally, after the sixth or seventh time, the piece split in two, the maul going down to the bottom. She put one hand on the large piece, one hand on the smaller one, and ripped the wood apart. I'm impressed, he said, sincere. She didn't look big enough to use a maul, let alone split wood. She whirled around, her hand going to her chest, her eyes flying to his face. She was just as beautiful as he remembered. The sweetness of her face, the kindness in her eyes, the sparkle that showed her life and humor, and rosy cheeks with her hair coming down out of her hat and flowing down her back, covered in snow but still golden underneath. You surprised me, she said, a little breathless and maybe a little reserved. He plunged in. I'm sorry, I should have texted you. I, I don't think I mentioned it, but I've been working on being better. I guess we maybe don't have time for that right now, but one of the things that I know I do is I just think about myself. I think that's natural. Right, I think it's natural, but it's not the way I want to be. I want to be a person who thinks about other people. I admire that. Thanks. I'm not there yet, and I'm working on it. And when I looked at my phone, had it in my hand, trying to think about what I wanted to say, I kept thinking you didn't want to hear about my day. You didn't want to hear about my flight and whether I got there safely or anything. It just felt like all I could think of to talk about were things about me. And I guess maybe I've just been so focused on not being all about me that I kind of froze and couldn't think of anything to say. Oh. Obviously, she hadn't thought about that, although he couldn't read her expression and couldn't tell whether it was a good O or a bad O. He kept talking. I thought about asking you questions, but the questions I wanted to know were kind of personal. I didn't want you to think I was weird or creepy by asking you what you had done all day, or if Graham and Pap were talking to Joe. I just... I wanted to know everything, and I didn't know how to say that. So, this is you apologizing for not texting me for the last eleven days? Not that I'm counting. Yeah, it's been eleven days, and I was counting. And yeah, I'm sorry. Forgiven. The word was easy, her expression blank. But then she shifted leaning a little on the mall, rubbing her hand over the top of it as she said, I didn't text you either. I could hardly be upset with you when I didn't do it myself. I noticed, he said simply. Then he said, And the more time that went by without you texting, the more I thought maybe, maybe you changed your mind. I thought the same thing. Worried about it, actually. You didn't need to. I haven't, won't, couldn't imagine. He wasn't saying anything very well. How could he want anyone else when Annie was everything he'd ever dreamed about? When being with her made him want to be better, to give her the very best, the best of his actions, the best of his words, the best of everything. It wasn't that he didn't care about anyone else, exactly, but he wanted her to be taken care of first. To have his time and attention, his compliments, all the good things. He wanted them all to be Annie's. That's a relief. I, I wasn't sure. I guess I had doubts, too. I know I did. I, 
I had time to text, but the more time went by, the more I wasn't sure what to say. Same, she said, grinning at him, and he returned it. But then her look became more serious. I, if we're going to be together, I don't want to do that again. If we have to be apart, we need to talk. The more days went by without hearing anything from you, the more I felt like, like I imagined everything that came before and that we really hadn't said the things I remembered. Then I'd imagine I convinced myself that I made up how you felt, that you hadn't really been saying that you wanted me, that I made something up in my head that wasn't real. And since I wasn't talking to you, those thoughts in my head became more real than what had actually happened. Does that make sense? She tilted her head, her eyes squinted, and he knew she was saying it so that he would understand her struggle. He understood all too well, because he'd had the same struggle. Only he also struggled with the areas that he'd been working on and thinking that he wasn't going to be putting his best foot forward even if he did text. I think that's a pretty good agreement. We won't let a single day go by without talking somehow. Even if it's just a text, a phone call, an email, something. If we can't be face to face. Seems like if a relationship is based on communication, we need to communicate. He took a breath and held it for a second, looking at her. Almost afraid to say the next bit, but knowing he needed to. We do have a relationship right? I think so. I thought we did, but I've kind of been up and down about it since you left. You mean you're not sure whether you want one or not? He asked, his chest almost heaving at the thought. He didn't want to hear her answer, and yet was hanging on her every breath. I do, she said immediately and with feeling, and then her face lifted in inquiry. Do you? I do. I, I couldn't wait to come see you. I couldn't quit thinking about you. I have a lot of things I want to talk to you about, but I'm supposed to be loading snow, since the streets are piled high, and if we want more than a one-lane track down Main Street, we need to get rid of some of it. That sounds like an accident waiting to happen, she said with a grin. You know, it didn't occur to me until just now, but maybe that splitting mall needs to be sharpened. Do you want me to check? He wanted to take care of her. He wanted to hold her. He wanted to smell her scent and feel her against him, feel her arms around him, and know she missed him. But there was a lot of work to do, and people were depending on both of them. I take it you got a fire started? He asked as she handed him the splitting mall. I did. It took me 45 minutes, but it's going now, and Graham has soup on the stovetop. There is no oven or any way to bake anything, or we'd be having bread, too. I stopped here first, after a stop at the parts store, and I was going to go check on Ralph and Joe, he said, opening up the shed door and looking inside. They're in the kitchen, along with Miss Matilda. That's all the seats we have, but we can probably fit three or four more if we bring some chairs from the living room, if you meet anyone who needs us. Shoving a hand in his pocket, he grabbed a mint and popped it in his mouth as his eyes got used to the dim interior of the shed. The file hung on the wall, and he reached over, grabbing it before he said anything. If I see anyone, I'll keep that in mind. My sister was cooking on her pellet stove, and there were fifty people in the parts store. He stepped back out of the shed with the splitting mall, coming within inches of Annie, who had stopped at the door of the shed while he walked in. The snow came down, landing on her lashes and nose as she looked up at him. And maybe they didn't have time. Maybe he should be focusing on the task at hand. But he put the file in the same hand as the splitting mall and put his arm around Annie's waist, drawing her to him and leaning down. I missed you. They were the words he wanted to say, the ones he wanted her to know. Maybe there were other ones, that he loved her heart, 
that he loved the grit that it must take for her to take the splitting maul and work on the wood. She had to have been doing it most of the day, and he loved that drive, the care and concern she had for others, the way she opened her home. All of it. I missed you too, she said, looking up at him, her hands on his chest before they slid around and they stood the way they had before he'd left, eleven days ago, in her living room. For the entire eleven days, he wished he'd kissed her before he left, and then he would have had that memory to think about as well. He'd have been able to think to himself that she wouldn't have kissed him if she didn't like him, right? Maybe it wouldn't have made a difference, but it was something he regretted. He could do it now, but he was holding the splitting maul and bastard file in one hand. There were layers and layers of clothes between them, and snow coming down, and people waiting on them to take care of them. Work to do. It didn't seem like the right time, so he just put his lips on her forehead, his nose against her hat, breathing deeply and longing with every beat of his heart to just stand here and be with her. Taking a deep breath, he pulled back. This is pretty dull. I think if I just give you a little bit more of an edge, it'll split slightly easier. It won't bounce off as much anyway, I hope. Yeah, it does depend some on the amount of force you use on the downward stroke of the maul as to how easily the wood breaks apart. He worked on sharpening the edge, thinking of all the things he wanted to talk to her about. The offer from his dad, the trip, the accident with the plane, which he was guessing she hadn't heard about since she hadn't said anything. And it probably hadn't gone around town like it might have if people were trying not to use their phones to conserve the batteries. Once they went dead, who knew when they would be able to charge them again? So he just said, I think the snow is supposed to taper off in a few hours, but I think we'll have another six inches or so by then. That's not bad. I guess once you hit two feet, what's another six inches? We get too much more and it's going to be over your head. He lifted a brow, wondering if he could tease her about that. He didn't even know how she felt about it. Maybe that's why God gave me you so I don't have to be out in it and worry about seeing over the top. I think you're probably right. He liked that idea, wanted to take care of her, and wished he didn't have to go. He'd split the wood for her, gladly. Let me work on it here for ten minutes before I go back. He felt his pocket buzz and figured that was probably his brother wanting to know where he was. You have things you need to do, she said. Eight minutes? Five. Deal, he said, grabbing a billet with one hand around the end and wiggling it back and forth so it stood up in the snow. Annie moved back out of the way, and he brought the splitting maul down, splitting the billet in two on the first swing. <laughs> Maybe I should let you do it all, she said. You make my fumbling efforts look pathetic. Part of that is a sharp edge, he said. You saw how I did it. If it starts bouncing off again, you can do it yourself. He pulled the bastard file out of his pocket where he'd shoved it. It's yours. Thanks, she smiled, reaching out for it and then taking it directly to the shed while he grabbed one of the halves and split that in two with one swing. In five minutes, he had a nice pile of wood and felt like maybe he'd given her a hand and saved her some time. I'm not sure how quickly it's going to burn, and I want to have enough to keep us warm overnight. I don't suppose you've heard anything about how soon Cruz will be out? I haven't, but just judging by what's happened in the past, once the snow stops, they'll be out, but they'll go to the most populated areas first. That's what I figured, and I assumed we'd be spending the night without electricity and probably the entire day and night tomorrow. That's about what I'm thinking as well. I'll be here tonight, hopefully. At least for a little bit. I didn't sleep last night. Why not? She asked, concern on her features immediately. Well, some of it's a long story, but we got in late, and we had to get the skid loader ready to go. We had one of the tracks off fixing it, and that project had been set aside when we brought the combines in. 
We just hadn't gotten back to it, although we had the parts we needed. I see. Well, yeah, definitely. Come in and take a break when you can. I think it will be warm enough in the living room that you can sleep on the couch, and I have plenty of blankets. Thanks. He wanted to stay and talk, didn't want to go. But life really wasn't about doing what he wanted to do, and he'd known that for most of it. You can text me any time, just so you know. I'll remember that. I'm sorry. No, I get it. It's really my place to make a move first, and I didn't. I kind of feel like that's a huge strike against me, and I hope you can look past it. I already have. He handed her the splitting maul, and she took it, her hands holding on to the handle just below his. Their gloves touched, and he looked at that for a moment, his big and masculine, hers much smaller and colorfully pink. Text me if you need anything. I don't think any stores are open, but Ray might be at the grocery store, and I know he has a generator big enough to run the refrigerators, but not to heat the store. I heard them talking about it in the barbershop last year during a bad ice storm. All right, I'll let you know, and you'll come in and take a rest as soon as you can? She asked, and he grinned. She was going to take care of him, and he couldn't say he disliked it. Maybe he didn't really want anyone telling him what to do, but it was tempered with the fact that she was telling him because she cared. That meant a lot. I will. Drinking her face in one last time, he turned and walked out the narrow path to the skid loader, pulling his phone out to see what his brother wanted. Chapter 15 She gathered up the wood that Lincoln had chopped and carried an armful to the porch. She stacked it carefully out of the falling snow and went back and got three more armfuls, stacking them all neatly by the door before she took two pieces and walked inside. She'd go back out in a bit and chop some more, but she was hungry. She hadn't even thought to offer him food. What kind of friend, more than friend, was she? Remembering her phone and how she hadn't texted when she should have, she set the wood down before she towed her boots off and pulled her phone out. Are you hungry? There's food here. I didn't think to offer you any. She'd been so excited to see him, had been fighting the longing to touch him, to wonder if he'd kiss her. She didn't even think about food for him. Maybe in a bit. Maybe you can ride with me some later? She stared at her phone. He wanted her to go with him? The idea hadn't occurred to her and she had no idea exactly what that would entail. Surely she wouldn't be sitting on the outside of something, freezing. She knew immediately he wouldn't ask her to do that, but she'd never ridden in any kind of equipment before, other than tractors on the farm, which she'd ridden with her dad. Sure, just let me know. There, that was being brave. Funny, the thing she wanted to do that she had no idea she wanted to do, but as soon as she found out Lincoln was doing them, she wanted to be involved too. Maybe that was what love was, or at least infatuation, wanting to be with someone all the time, no matter what they were doing. She supposed those were the feelings that wore off, but she felt pretty confident that they both had the bones underneath to make it work. Bones meaning character. After all, any man who had been working on improving himself before he'd found the girl he wanted was a man she knew was working for the right reasons. Some guys changed temporarily when they found someone they wanted, changing just enough to attract the one they were interested in, almost like lying, since they changed back after the vows were said. That seemed unfair in Annie's view. She'd avoided men like that, avoided anyone who changed just for her. Not that anyone had been falling over themselves to do so. She grabbed the wood and walked on stocking feet to the kitchen, where five elderly folks were gathered around the table, 
playing cards. They all looked up when she walked in. It's warm in here, she said, happy. The stove was working. We've been taking turns checking it. We don't want it to go out, because we don't want you to have to struggle to start it again. Her gram set her cards down. Well, maybe I'm a little smarter now than I was the last time, and maybe it won't take so long. She walked over to the stove, setting the wood down beside it. But I appreciate your consideration, because it would be nice to not have to find out. At least not today. It's been eventful enough. It was kind of eventful, wasn't it? Her gram said, a little smile tilting the corners of her mouth up as she exchanged a glance with Miss Matilda. Miss Matilda was a little more direct. You and Lincoln were standing awfully close. He was sharpening the splitting mall. That's interesting. I've never seen that done one-handed before, Joe said from the head of the table. There was laughter around, and Annie figured there was no point in trying to hide anything. I guess he's just multi-talented, Annie said, knowing she was blushing but also smiling rather proudly. She loved having a man who was able to help the community, and she wanted to be able to help him do as much as she could. He's a good man, Pap said. Don't let these old geezers and these nice young ladies, his eyes went to Graham and Miss Matilda, tell you any differently. You got yourself a good one. She wasn't sure whether she had him exactly, but if that's what Pap wanted to think, she wouldn't disagree. She could hope. I might go out with him a little later. Do you guys think you'll be okay? She asked. They all nodded, and a couple of them murmured an assent. But she didn't pay too much attention because her phone buzzed in her pocket again. Pulling it out, she thought it was from Lincoln, so she opened the screen. Would you ask Ralph and Joe and Miss Matilda if they have the water in their houses shut off? I'll do that if they want me to so their pipes don't burst. She hadn't even thought of that and lifted her head immediately. Do any of you need your water shut off in your houses? Lincoln said he'll do that because it's probably going to get pretty cold in there before the electricity comes back on. I need mine shut off, Joe said immediately. There's a lever in the basement, then he'll need to drain the lines, maybe flush the toilet. Mine's in the basement too. And I would have gone down, but I didn't think about it. It's a spigot. I can tell him where it is if he calls me when he's doing it. Ralph set his cards face down on the table, his brows furrowed in concern. She didn't want them worrying about their water, so she started texting back. My grandsons told me how to do it, but I haven't been down in the cellar in years. My knees just won't take it. I almost fell the last time I went down, and I decided no more, Miss Matilda said, and Annie added her into the text as well. I told him, you guys don't need to worry. I know he'll take care of it. Sure enough, a text came back almost immediately. I'm waiting for the dump truck to get back, so I'll run into Joe's and Ralph's houses now and get Miss Matilda's after the next load. She read the text aloud, and their faces showed their relief. Annie grabbed the spoon that was sitting on the counter and stirred the stew on the stove. Did everyone eat? she asked. We did. We figured we'd leave it on there, over to the side so it wouldn't get too hot. But it would be warm for you when you came in, Graham said, her face looking matronly. Have you eaten yet today? If it's okay, I'm going to grab a bowl right now. Lincoln said he might want one later, too. I made it for everyone. Help yourself, Graham said. She had barely finished speaking when Ralph said, Hey, you already put the ace of spades down. You can't put another one down. There won't be two in the deck. You're cheating. Annie had wondered how long the two men would be able to get along without bickering. While she scooped the stew out, they went through the pile and finally decided that the ace that Joe had put down had been the ace of clubs, and Ralph just didn't have his glasses on. 
She tried not to snicker at the idea that Joe had to flee his house because of the terrible snowstorm, but he had still thought to shove a couple of aces up his sleeve, just in case he landed somewhere where he'd end up playing cards in preparation for cheating. Sometimes old men didn't make sense. Maybe Miss Matilda and Graham were thinking the same things, because they all shared a look together. That was pretty much the way the next hour went before Lincoln's text buzzed in her pocket. Dad says his knees are wearing out, and he's tired of going up and down, in and out of the dump truck. Want to come ride for a bit? I'll bring soup. I knew there was a reason I keep hanging around you. She could almost feel his smile through that text. See the grin. Smell the mint. Grabbing a bowl with a lid from the cupboard, she turned to the stove and started scooping stew into it. I'm going to run out and ride with Lincoln for a bit. When I get back, I'll split some more wood. She had just thrown two more pieces into the fire and figured at that rate they would need more wood for overnight. She didn't want to run out. Of course, she knew she would be able to text Lincoln at any time, and he would come split wood for her. It wouldn't take him long to have more than enough for the entire night and all day tomorrow. But she didn't want to take him from work that benefited the entire town and do work that she could do herself, just it would take her longer. Somebody can't keep the smile off their face, Miss Matilda said as she turned from the stove to put the ladle back on the counter. Someone told me he was a good man. Can you blame me? I cannot, Miss Matilda said, maternal affection in her smile. Annie could hardly get her boots on fast enough, and she almost didn't remember to shove a spoon in her pocket as she hurried out and down the narrow path. She needed to shovel again, but the snow did look like it was tapering off, and when she looked up, the sky seemed much brighter. The big storm was almost over. Annie went around the house, coming to the sidewalk, which was not shoveled, and looking up and down the deserted streets. Snow was piled high on either side, and it was almost like she'd have to climb a mountain to get to the street. Where was she supposed to meet him? She had gloves on and was holding the bowl in her hand, and she would need to set it down before she could get her phone out of her pocket. She figured she might as well go to the porch steps, which hadn't been shoveled since she'd done it the last time and probably had a foot of snow on them. She'd almost reached them when she heard a rumbling. Looking up, she saw the top of the hood and the cab of a dump truck sticking up over the mountain of snow that lined the streets as it went down Main Street. It stopped right in front of her house, the top of the snow even with the door. She wasn't quite sure how she was going to get in, but it wasn't going to be by sitting here and wondering about it, so she got up and started climbing the mountain of snow, using her elbows a couple of times to balance, since her hands were occupied. She reached the top. Standing up, she had to look down on the truck. An odd sensation. Lincoln had opened the passenger door, and he leaned over the seat, looking up at her, waiting for her to notice him. This is kind of neat, she said, enjoying the uniqueness of looking down on someone. I feel like I'm king of the mountain, taller than the trucks. And the bearer of my dinner, I'm starving. I don't think you appreciate how much I love being tall, she said leaning in and carefully holding the bowl of soup in one hand, holding it out to him. Ah, oh, that's nice and warm. The heater in this thing isn't the greatest. I just got it off the stove. Graham set it to the side, and the wood stove makes a great warming area. Mine was nice and toasty, too. I've been starving ever since you sent me that text. Up until that point, I hadn't really noticed how hungry I was. He eyed her as she carefully held on to the top of the door and grabbed the grab handle as she stepped in, swinging into her seat and slamming the door behind her. Nicely done. Thank you, 
she said, kind of proud of herself. She wouldn't have thought she was a swinging into a truck kind of girl, but sometimes a person learns new things about themselves. Mm, it's delicious, too, he said. Graham is quite a cook, she said, knowing that the soup was one of Graham's specialties. So is her granddaughter, he said, even if you serve a lot of vegetables. <laughs> because I care about the people who eat my food, she said, stumbling just a little because she almost said love. She didn't want to say that, didn't want to scare him away, even though she felt like it might be true, that she loved him. It certainly felt that way, although the rational part of her brain said it hadn't been long enough for her to know whether or not she truly did. But another part, just as rational, said that it didn't have to take a lot of time. A person just needed to know the character of the person they were with. And maybe their own character played a part in it, too, since love was an action, much less than tender feelings. I don't know if your brother texted you or not, but the Emerson brothers have been working on keeping the roads cleared around the outlying farms. There's no way they can keep up with the storm, but they've got equipment, too and they'll be working to make sure feed trucks can get in and out and farmers aren't stranded, with their animals starving to death. He did text me, just said the generator was running and they were fine. He was checking on me, and he assured me that he could get in here if I needed him. She laughed a little. Then she said, But I'm not sure how he was going to do that. Plus, I would never ask him to leave his wife and children to come take care of me. Maybe he'd want to, as long as they were taken care of as well. If they've got a generator, Meg will be just as good there whether it snows or whether it doesn't. That's true, but I wouldn't want him to risk it. And someone will have to be out doing the barn work. I suppose it's always possible that something could happen to the generator. I hope not. That's a lot of hungry hogs if something does. That's so true. I'm glad the Emerson brothers are working to keep the roads open. Yeah, it's nice to live in a community where everyone takes care of everyone else. He tapped the bowl with his finger before scraping out the last few bites. He snapped the lid on and set the bowl and spoon on the floor between them. I kind of wanted to talk about that, but if you don't mind, can we do it while we're driving? Of course, she said assuming he would want to get moving as soon as he was done eating. He depressed the clutch, shoving the knob for the air brakes in, and hooked low gear, pulling out. One good thing, you don't really have to worry about anyone else being on the road right now. He grinned over at her, catching second and moving with confidence between the two banks of snow. Yeah, it seems like it's going to be forever until we get out. Maybe we'll still be in here by Christmas. She said that as she looked at the street lights and the Christmas decorations hanging off of them. In some cases, the snow was almost touching the bottoms of the stars and bells. I think we'll have it done by then. We're dumping it in the creek outside of town, which is frozen over, but the temperatures are supposed to warm up slightly, so it'll melt nice and slow and not flood. That will be wonderful. Good thing about getting snow this time of year versus March or April when you have a tendency to get a really warm day, and then you're dealing with flooding. Yeah, he said, but sounded like he was distracted. He eased the truck in front of the bank, where his dad was sitting with the skid loader, and pulled the knob for the air brakes out with a hiss, making sure the transmission was in neutral. I knew when my dad wanted to go to Argentina that he was thinking about expanding his operations into several places down there operating a harvest crew basically down there the way he did here. I kind of thought that might be what you were doing, but I never heard. He wants me to run it. From there? Like, move to Argentina? She couldn't keep the shock out of her voice. Yeah, for at least part of the year. They have an off-season as well, and I'd be up here then. It would be our summer. He grunted. I'll probably end up being as busy, if not busier, on my off time, 
he said, using his fingers to do air quotes when he said the word off. The truck shook as a heavy load of snow fell into the bed, and she grabbed the door handle, not expecting it. Once she figured out what it was, she grinned at Lincoln, who was looking at her with concern. I've just never been in a truck when it's being loaded before. I didn't realize it shook. That's normal, I assume, since you don't seem to be concerned. Yeah, normal. Sorry, wasn't quite sure what was wrong, but you looked like you were ready to evacuate. I wasn't sure whether I should be following you or not. Maybe you knew something I didn't. No, just me overreacting to the world shaking underneath me. Sorry, I should have warned you. I didn't even think about it. It made her think about how different they were. She'd grown up on a farm, sure, but she'd grown up more on the periphery, helping in the house and garden and caring for people versus the crops and animals. He was probably the exact opposite. And now, he was going to move to Argentina? Chapter 16 So what did you tell him? Annie asked, figuring they might as well figure this out now. She could feel all the excitement and hope that had been blossoming in her chest at him being home, and them stepping into a new and exciting relationship together, and now she felt it wither and almost felt betrayed. Would that be their life together? Her waiting around for him for months on end while he was at the bottom of the globe? I told him I'd give him an answer by Christmas. He has a couple of other people that would work for the position, but he doesn't want them as much as he wants me. You're his son. A couple of those are, too. I suggested Truman and Franklin, and both of them would work. But Dad said I had some qualities that made me a good choice, and I guess he's right. Like your ability to talk to people, just casual friendship and get along with everyone? She was guessing, but that's the kind of person he was. The truck shook again, and this time she didn't move. Funny, it only took one time for her to get used to it. I guess. I don't know. It's easy to see your own flaws and sometimes hard to see your assets. Although, I guess at one point it was the other way around for me. I know you said you worked on that, and you really are considerate. You chopped wood for me today, and that was more than enough to get us through the day. It saved me tons of time. It probably takes me half an hour to do one piece, and you did five or so in five minutes. She was not jealous. Well, not very jealous. <laughs> you don't sound bitter about that, he said, giving her a side eye. I'm not. Did I mention the poison I put in your stew? His eyes widened before he grinned, and she winked at him before her lips curved up as well. I have to remember those thoughts are in that head of yours, all that beautiful blonde hair and those sweet, innocent eyes, and now I hear you're thinking about poisoning me. No, that was the furthest thing from my mind. She felt like she had to say that, even though she knew he knew it. He sobered. I... I guess I'm a little tempted. It's a huge responsibility. Dad's sinking a lot of money into this, and there's the potential for it to be really big. It's an honor to be asked. It's an honor that he considers me worthy. Lincoln looked at his hands, resting on top of the steering wheel, as another load of snow dumped into the bed of the truck. I can't say that it isn't trying to go to my head a little, you know? that Dad thinks I can do it, and I want to prove that I can, live up to his expectations of me. I get that. My parents aren't even alive, and sometimes I think about what they might expect, and I expect that of myself as well. Yeah, I guess it doesn't stop, ever, does it? No, I think we always want our parents to be proud of us. That's one of the things I really like about you. 
You know, my mom just walked out on us boys, and I love looking at you and seeing how devoted you've been to your grandparents. Knowing that's the kind of person you are, that you gave up all the things you might have been able to do as a young 20-something, freedom, the money you could earn, the places you could have gone, the things that normal people take for granted, you left just so that you could care for them. That's huge in my eyes, because it seems to be the opposite of what my mom did. He looked over at her, then she could read the hurt on his face. It wasn't hard to figure that having his mom walk out was probably one of the defining acts of his life, something that had marked him and would continue to mark him forever. I'm sorry about that. I just can't even imagine a mom doing that, walking away from her own kid. Kids, there were so many of you, and she put herself first. He nodded. Yeah, that's exactly right. She put herself first, and you don't. And I suppose that's part of the reason that I set out to try to change myself, because I saw me becoming like her, where I put myself first, talked about myself, allowed myself to feel a little arrogant when people asked me questions, like their interest was a compliment, but I didn't bother to show the same amount of interest back. Just took it as my due. I don't know. Just a lot of things the Lord showed me that I didn't like in her, but I saw in myself. I guess that's something I admire about you, if we're talking about those kinds of things. And why wouldn't they? She wanted him to know that she admired him. I love that you're determined to put yourself on a course and stick to it. Just the fact that you quit smoking, that's huge. And it shows that you can decide to do something, and then you have the strength of character to follow through. I'm glad there's something you can admire, because I was thinking about you making me want to be a better person, and being in a relationship with you is the kind of relationship I want but I want to be able to elicit the same kind of feelings in someone else. Are you asking if you inspire me? She tilted her head, grinning. Not really. Well, maybe. It's funny you should say that, because as I was walking inside, thinking about the wood that you chopped for me, and wishing, maybe just a little, that you would stay home and chop all the wood and then be cozy in the house with me. But then I thought about the work that you were doing in town and how proud I was that I was with someone who was such a valuable asset to the community. And I thought to myself that I wanted to be behind you as much as I could, helping in every way I could, helping you be better so that you can help more people. So I guess that answers your question, doesn't it? And that was just today. An odd buzzing sound pierced the air making Annie jump. What was that? <laughs> that was the horn. Dad honking at me, letting me know that the bed is full and I can go dump. He looked over at her as he depressed the clutch, hooked it in gear, and said, I hope it doesn't make you nervous, but there's not enough room to turn around, so we're backing up. She found that she wasn't the slightest bit nervous at all. I trust you, she said feeling odd that she couldn't turn around and see what was happening behind them. She had to look at the mirror, which wasn't angled for her to see. He was using it, so she assumed the angle was right for the driver, which made a lot of sense, and she certainly wasn't going to complain. So I guess that's kind of what I wanted to talk to you about, some of the things that have been going over in my mind although Dad really threw a wrench in my thoughts when he asked me if I would take charge of his Argentina project. He shot her a glance. Do you have any thoughts on that? I guess I'm not real excited that you'll be gone, what, at least six months at a time? Could she handle that? I mean, you were only gone ten days, and I was just full of doubts and wondering what in the world was going on and wondering if we were even together. I can't imagine six months. Actually, I'm starting to miss you already. Isn't that weird? Yeah, I wanted to see what you'd say, but I'm thinking I won't take it. 
First of all, I assumed you wouldn't want to leave your grandparents. He slowed down and turned the wheel as they backed into the parts store parking lot and then pulled out, driving on the road which was slightly wider at the edge of town, where the houses weren't as clustered. Well, I definitely wouldn't do it now, but... She didn't want to make assumptions, but she wanted to be clear. If we were to get married, my place is with my husband. Although I would hope you wouldn't ask me to leave my grandparents, knowing that I care for them. You would marry someone knowing that they might take you away from your grandparents? She had to think about that. It was a question that had never entered her brain before. I think it would be hard. That would be extremely hard. But I don't think my grandparents would want me to stay and give up the possibility of living with my soulmate. Although, again, I hope I wouldn't have to make that choice. I'm sorry. I'm kind of pushing. I don't mean to. I don't want you to ever have to choose between your grandparents and me. Thank you. I... I think I know what I would choose, but it wouldn't be an easy choice. Yeah, I wouldn't want to do that to you. That would be wrong. I had to take that into consideration while I was thinking about this. As much as I would like to please my dad, and as much as I would like to prove that I can do what he thinks I can, I'm pretty sure I'm going to turn the Argentina thing down. She couldn't deny she felt relief even though it was exciting and such a huge opportunity, and she wouldn't mind traveling some and seeing the world a little, since she hadn't done it when she was younger, because of taking care of her grandparents. But I guess that leaves me with a similar problem, because right now, my job still takes me away from here for six or more months out of the year, and I wouldn't want that if I were to be settling down with someone. He grinned over at her. The last ten days have taught me that, at least. That was a nice learning experience, wasn't it? She said, and they laughed together. He downshifted, the engine brake rumbling low, as they came up to the creek, and she could see where the snow had been piling up, with the payloader sitting there looking like it had been used a few times from the tracks around it. So, I think I'll let my dad know, and I'll ask you... His voice trailed off as he depressed the clutch and engaged the PTO, fingering a lever as a new sound hummed just under the level of the engine, and the bed of the truck started going up in the air. She waited until the truck shook as the snow came off. He moved forward some, and then he pulled out as the bed came down. When he started back toward town without saying anything more, she couldn't wait any longer, and she prompted him. You'll ask me what? I don't want you to get scared, but when I said I wanted to be with you, I wasn't thinking that it was just a fling or a good time. I'm looking for someone to settle down with, and I'm thinking you might be the one. I want to be serious, with that thought in mind, when we're together. She liked that, the idea that they weren't dating just for a casual relationship or whatever people dated for kind of pointless if there wasn't an end goal in sight. That's exactly the way I think. Then I guess it's settled. All except what I'm going to do since I'm thinking I won't go out on the harvest crew this year. If I'm not going to, I ought to tell my dad as soon as possible so he can find someone to replace me. That would be up to you. I definitely would prefer you don't, but what were you thinking of doing instead? I'd really like to buy a farm. That's been in the back of my head since I started, and I've been saving money toward it ever since I was about 12, maybe younger. Wow. I assumed you'd be okay with that. You grew up on one. We could have your grandparents living with us. Yeah, she said slowly, not wanting to be the reason he didn't get what he wanted, but wanting to be honest. I know my grandparents prefer to be in town. They can walk to church, walk to the post office, the grocery store. They have friends around, and they're not isolated. That's part of the reason they moved off the farm to begin with. Oh, 
he said, glancing over at her, all humor erased from his face. I hadn't considered that. Well, this is something we can work out together, right? It's not a deal breaker. No, I know we'll be able to figure something out. If you're in the United States, that's enough of a concession. Whatever else happens, we'll have to work it out with my grandparents, but I'm with you. He grinned, like her loyalty was important to him and was exactly what he wanted. I probably shouldn't keep you too long, and I thought maybe we could talk about something fun for a while. I didn't mean to spend all your time with me in a serious discussion. I, I was afraid you'd find me a little boring, which was one of the reasons I didn't text you. There is this funny little excitement that flutters in my chest when you're around. I hardly think I'm going to find you boring, she said, laughter in her tone. I guess I have that same funny little excitement, only it kind of talks to me. It talks to you? Her brows lifted. Should I be concerned about this? Maybe, because it says, you need to kiss the girl. He shrugged. So far, I've been ignoring it, but it's been hard. Maybe you should stop. He glanced over at her, his eyes crinkled but definitely interested. Listening? No, ignoring it, because I agree with it. They smiled together, and she kind of thought that maybe he was going to take her advice. She was looking forward to it. Chapter 17 Lincoln held the back door open for Annie to walk in. His brother, Franklin, had come to drive his dump truck for a while after his own truck had broken down. As much as he had enjoyed having Annie with him, Lincoln wasn't going to turn down the opportunity to go chop some more wood for her and to check the house and make sure everyone was okay. He hadn't liked that she'd been alone during the storm. Not alone. She'd had the elderly folks' as company, but the responsibility for taking care of everything had been on her shoulders. They took their boots off in the mudroom. She hadn't said much after they'd talked about his dad's offer. He was pretty sure they were back to where they'd been before and he could turn the offer down because he wanted to be with Annie more than he wanted to be in charge of his dad's new venture. Maybe it was a sacrifice to give up something that could be so lucrative, but Annie was more than worth it to him. You're back, Miss Matilda said as they walked into the warm kitchen. And you brought Lincoln with you. We are and I did. Annie's cheeks were red from the cold, and her eyes sparkled as she glanced back at him, making him wish that he'd taken the opportunity to kiss her in the woodshed and not been so focused on getting wood chopped. She took their container to the sink while he walked to the wood stove with his armload of wood. Did you guys get tired of playing cards at the table? Annie asked as she set the dishes down and turned around, indicating the empty table where a stack of cards still sat. We decided to do a little decorating, Pap said as he stepped out of the hall and into the kitchen. And I have to say, it's gorgeous, Graham said with a smile that seemed ornery, almost. Lincoln glanced at Annie to see if she noticed anything odd about the way her Graham was grinning, but Annie had been looking at him, almost as though she'd been waiting on him to meet her gaze. She spoke as soon as he did. Do you want to go see? Sure. He moved from the stove following her back down the hall behind her grandparents. The house is cold, but it's not too bad, he observed. As long as we keep moving and go into the kitchen to warm up, we've been fine. Graham turned and went into the living room, stopping just inside the room, barely leaving any place for Annie and him to stand. They crowded together in the doorway, and he had to say he didn't mind. He put a hand on her shoulder, and she lifted her head to smile softly at him. If there were any new Christmas decorations in the room, he didn't think either of them noticed. He sure didn't, anyway. What do you think of our decorations? Miss Matilda asked, and she too was standing close to the doorway. 
like they were using their bodies to block Annie and Lincoln from coming in any further. Reluctantly, Lincoln looked away from Annie and around the room. Next time they were in the woodshed together, he was kissing her before he did anything. He didn't care how badly they needed wood chopped. I'm sorry, but I don't see anything different, Annie said slowly after they'd both taken a few minutes to look around the room. That's because you're looking in the wrong direction, Pap said, nodding his head above them. Lincoln looked up at the same time Annie did. He couldn't help the grin that moved the corners of his mouth up as he saw the new decoration and realized he and Annie were standing right under it. She smiled too and didn't seem the slightest bit upset that they'd been tricked into standing under the newly hung mistletoe. You know what that means, Joe intoned. Relax, old man. Maybe you moved fast when you were my age, but Annie doesn't like me jumping on her and grabbing her. Annie laughed outright at that, since he'd actually done that very thing when they met. Actually, since this is the modern era, I think I'll go get my stool and do the kissing. No point in waiting around until Lincoln feels the time is right. Maybe I better go help you with that stool, Lincoln murmured. The men protested, but Graham and Miss Matilda shushed them. Lincoln hardly paid attention as Annie's hand slipped into his and she tugged him out of the doorway. He'd kiss her anywhere, but he supposed he didn't really want an audience. After all, it was their first kiss, and he wanted it to be perfect. The older folk actually stayed in the living room as Annie led him into the kitchen before turning around and looking up at him. Am I being too forward? Too obvious that I'm planning on getting you alone so I can kiss you? I love it. The words were true, although he really didn't want to talk. Not now. She didn't seem to either, and she stepped closer, putting her arms around his neck and lifting her face toward his. Don't make me get my step stool. Her voice was soft and husky. He chuckled as he lowered his head and said, just before his lips touched hers, as long as you're not hitting me with it. Their smiles made things a little awkward as their lips brushed and their teeth clacked together before they adjusted the angle and their mouths moved together. His arms tightened around her and pulled her close, knowing that telling his dad no was the absolute right decision. He could drag Annie with him, but he wouldn't ask her to leave her grandparents. After all, look at how they were trying to get them together. So sweet. It was a long time later before they heard movement in the living room and pulled apart. Remind me to thank your grandparents, he said, his heart beating hard and his breath unsteady. I owe them a thank you as well, she said, in the same husky tone her eyes glazed and looking at him like he was the best thing that ever happened to her. He hoped he could live up to that look. The hall floor creaked, and he knew their few moments of privacy were almost over. I love you. He hadn't planned on saying it, but it was true. It's basically what he was saying in the dump truck when he told her he wasn't dating for fun. I love you too, she said, and her voice was confident and sure. And yeah, the older folks were coming down the hall, and yeah, he should back up and let her go. But instead, he lowered his head and kissed her again. Epilogue Preston Emerson stood in the vestibule of the small church in Prairie Rose, Iowa. Christmas Eve. His favorite service of the whole year had been over for almost an hour. It had taken people a little longer than normal to disperse, since Lincoln and Annie had announced their engagement. They planned to marry in a few weeks and had invited everyone to their informal wedding. It would be a potluck lunch and a time for fellowship afterward. A lot of congratulations were said, 
and Lincoln had a conversation with Preston and a few other men about buying the land behind Annie's house that adjoined the town limits of Prairie Rose. Mr. Jameson, the owner of the ground, had offered it to him when he'd heard about their dilemma of finding a farm, but needing to keep Annie's grandparents in town. Preston figured Lincoln and Annie, and their grandparents, were going to have a very happy Christmas, knowing they'd all be together, and Lincoln would still realize his dream of having a farm. Annie hadn't been able to stop smiling, and Preston had been happy for her. It had been a different story with Carmen. She'd sat by herself at the service, since all of her kids had parts or jobs, Preston hated seeing her alone. Every time he did, the temptation was always there to go and be with her. He couldn't imagine what was wrong with her husband to be married to the most amazing woman in the world and allow her to be alone on Christmas Eve. He had some pretty wonderful children, too, who had all done a beautiful job tonight, and he'd missed it all. Preston tried to shove down his anger at the man, to have such an incredible family and to not appreciate them. Actually, he didn't just not appreciate them. He was downright unkind to them, if small-town rumors were true. Preston had spent enough time with the kids to know it wasn't just small-town rumors, but for now, he was leaving things in the Lord's hands. I want to sit with her. Drive her home, Lord. Wrap presents and laugh together. Lord, she's not mine. Take these longings away, please. God had never lifted the feelings from him, so he'd learned to push them aside as best he could and ignore them when he couldn't. There were just a few families left in the church, and Carmen and her children were one. They had been helping to clean up while Carmen chatted with Catherine. Snow fell softly outside, drifting down lazily in the glow of the streetlight. It was hard to believe the next day was Christmas. A little depressing, too. Another Christmas. Not alone, since he had places he was going and people he was helping, but without a family of his own. Lord, have you forgotten about me? A simple prayer, but Preston knew the answer. How could God send him someone when his heart and soul were still stuck on Carmen? Would he always be stuck on her? The door opened and he turned his head. Carmen's children walked through, the four of them talking excitedly to themselves and greeting him when they saw him. He smiled and returned their Christmas greetings and they kept walking. Carmen didn't say anything but he foolishly looked at her as she came within a few inches of him in the small vestibule. Her step stumbled. His natural reaction was to reach out to steady her. He fisted his hand instead. Her eyes closed for a fraction of a second, and she pulled both lips in, hesitating a breath before walking out the door. Preston didn't move, didn't follow her with his eyes, didn't turn to see her go. Even though her family and she were the reason he stood where he was, waiting, waiting for them to leave, to see them as far as he could safely, which was only to their car, but it was the best he could do, so it had to be enough. Although it wasn't, it would never be enough. Maybe he should leave Prairie Rose. Lord? If God didn't give him a no, he had to leave. He couldn't keep doing this, watching from a distance as another man neglected and took advantage of the woman he loved. He shouldn't love her. Actually, loving her was okay. It was coveting her that was wrong. He needed to move. Go east, or north, or west, or somewhere anywhere. Maybe he should get his pilot's license and deliver supplies to missionaries in the jungle. Come April, he'd have to look into that, because Carmen would never be his.
This has been Heartland Mistletoe, A Heartland Cowboy Christmas Sweet Romance, Book 8. Written by Jesse Gussman. Performed by J. Dice. Executive Production and Cover Art by Julia Gussman. Editing by Heather Hayden. Copyright 2022 by Jesse Gussman. Production Copyright by Jesse Gussman.